This was in late November of 2012. And I was doing an install in a winery in North Carolina. It was a long day because we were working out of town. So we worked late to get it finished in one day. I started driving home around midnight and had about a three hour drive back home to Oakland. It's 1.30 in the morning. I'm outside of Stockton and I see this girl standing on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. She's wearing a little white dress that ends about three inches above her knees and is barefoot. She has long black hair flowing down her shoulders and she is just standing still as a statue. I looked at her as I drove by, but she didn't move. Didn't acknowledge my loud truck as it passed or anything. I was pretty freaked out because you always hear stories like this. And then she just appears in your vehicle with you. But that wasn't the case. She just stood there in the night. The thing that was most weird to me was that it was cold that night in the low 40s, as well as drizzling a fair bit. And she was wearing a short dress and had no shoes standing on the asphalt. If this was just some girl who does this for fun to freak people out, I feel like she would have been extremely cold and would have been shivering. But this girl did not move. Now, after I got home, I was thinking about it. And I searched ghost girl outside of Stockton. And I found a bunch of articles and stories about the East Eight Mile Road ghost girl. And most of the descriptions fit what I saw to a T. I never went back to the area because I moved to another state shortly after but I want to travel back there to see what I can find one day. Has anyone else seen this girl in that area? Or has anyone else seen a ghost girl in general on the side of a road like this one? Any info would be appreciated. My grandparents own about 600 acres in East Texas, about 15 minutes down a long dirt road. So basically, out in the middle of nowhere. The land has been used mainly for cattle ranching for the past four generations. And if you walk the land long enough, you'll find little remnants of the past in various areas all the way back to the 1800s, like a single dilapidated brick well amongst tall woods, about a third of a chimney and an old general store, unrecognizable in the grown up woods around it. In fact, I swear it's gonna fall down any day now because all that's holding it up are the trees around it and it's leaning like nobody's business. In the middle of the land, we've built up a simple cabin with a long porch on the back, overlooking a decent sized pond, roughly 20 acres. The first couple of stories come from my dad and his family, three sisters and his mum and dad, who lived about 15 miles from the ranch. One night, they were coming home from Wednesday night Bible class. The newspaper had little snippets of people seeing an unidentified flying object in the sky, but everyone wrote them off as crazy backcountry people with nothing better to do. So they're in the truck discussing these articles, and my dad jokingly points up to a light in the sky high above them, saying that it must be another UFO. As they're watching it though, it starts to get closer and closer. And eventually, I kid you not, lands in the middle of the road. They come to a dead stop with this thing in front of them. These are devout Christians. And they swear up and down that it really happened. It's nighttime. So all they can see are lights spaced around a circular object 
that's occupying the entire road. The only thing they hear from this thing is a light hum. The entire time, my aunts are screaming and begging my grandpa to turn around and go back into town. But he's stubborn and refuses. Eventually, the thing lifts off the road and hovers above the trees next to them. My grandpa takes off, going a hundred miles an hour down the road towards the house, with this thing keeping up with them to their right side. Eventually, to their relief, it flies away. A few minutes later, they are pulling into their driveway to see that the UFO had landed in their back pasture 200 yards away. My grandpa runs into the house, grabs a shotgun, and by the time he gets back out, it flies away for good. I'm not saying that this was an alien or anything. It could have well been government, but they knew exactly where they lived and wanted to mess with them. A year later, my dad and his brother-in-law are raccoon hunting at night. At the ranch in the 20 acres where the pond was later placed. As they were walking, they heard something large crunching the leaves along the side of them. They'd shine the light where they heard the noise and would then hear it in the opposite side. Again, they'd shine the light towards the sound, and it would immediately be on the other side of them. This happened countless times, so they eventually stood back to back and shined two flashlights at the same time in order to catch a glimpse of it. Even though they could never actually see what it was, they could hear it running around in circles. They ended up trying as best they could to ignore it, all the while, this thing continues to walk beside them and running around them in circles. I was about 17 for this next story. My dad and I would spend weekends down at the cabin hunting and fishing and would sleep in a room that had a window between the head of the two beds looking out onto the porch. This one particular night, I woke up at around 3.30 a.m to the sound of someone running and walking the length of the porch, which was around 20 yards long. Eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. I could hear that A, it did not have shoes, and B, it did not have more than two legs, and C, it was large enough to make a loud thud per step. For about 10 minutes, I'm listening to this thing sprint across the back porch and then walk a few steps followed by more sprinting. The scared little about to be poop my pants 17 year old girl I was just could not bring myself to turn around and look out the window to see who the heck that was. I guess part of me was terrified it would be like a scene from the Twilight Zone movie where the thing is ripping out an engine from a plane's wing and then suddenly appears at the passenger window staring at Jeff Daniels, teeth barred, with drool hanging out of its mouth. Eventually, the sound wakes up my dad, who was snoring loudly at the time. As soon as this thing on the porch senses my dad's lack of snoring, it quits. Never heard it again after that. Half a year later, my dad is out at the cabin alone. He's sighting in his new gun's laser sight. I know, obnoxious. He's doing this from the porch, and something chucks a rock at him, just barely missing him. He shines a light towards the direction it was thrown from, and nothing. Just a field of grass. Nothing visible that could have thrown that at him, and he quickly went back inside. Last time I was there, a couple of friends and I were sitting in the living room and heard a series of three loud knocks, three different times on the various areas of the side of the cabin. Remember, this place is in the middle of nowhere, with no one around it for miles. I'm pretty sure I will never stay there alone.
This story happened to my sister-in-law four years ago. They are uber religious, and the state of her mental stability, on top of a finger found and a police follow-up, makes this story a hundred percent true, and searchable. Last July, my sister-in-law Jackie was going back to Boise to visit for the weekend. Her husband lives in Provo and is going to law school there, as he's just graduated from a BYU chapter somewhere in southern Idaho. I'm not from Idaho, and I'm not Mormon, so I don't remember where it's located. Anyway, Jackie decided to drive from Provo, Utah, and head up to BYU to say hello to her friends just before coming back to Boise. The route she was on was I-15, which forks off into I-84 up to Boise. After you pass through Salt Lake City, the route becomes lost in a plain rolling flat of miscellaneous desert dotted by farmland here and there. Jackie left Provo, Utah in the evening, as she planned on making dinner for her husband before her departure. She ended up leaving around 11pm, and given the late time, she decided to forego visiting her friends at the BYU chapter, and headed along I-84 to come straight to Boise. She was in between Tremonton, Utah, and Burley, Idaho, in the literal middle of nowhere, where she drove up to what looked like a body lying in the road. The location is so desolate, there are no radio channels, cell phone services, or lights to be seen for hours. This 24 year old girl was in the middle of the desert, in a green Dodge car that already had enough problems, so it's a miracle she made it home to us without issue to begin with. She arrived at my wife's parents' house, but that was just the beginning of the story really. Here is her account of what led to these events. At 2am she said she saw something lying on the road in the distance. As she approached it, she could see it was a body, lifeless, in the middle of nowhere. It stretched across both lanes, and she could not simply pass without running it over. Cautiously she came to a stop, and made sure she parked about 15 yards away, and stopped. She opened the door and yelled, Are you alright? but no response could be heard. With the car lights broadcasting brightly on the body in the road, she got out of her car and slowly walked towards the person. As she got about 10 feet from the body in the road, she could see it was a dummy, fully dressed in human clothes just lying there. Terrified, she sprinted back to her car, slammed on the door, and sped over the dummy. We received the cell phone call from her around Mountain Home, 45 minutes away from Boise. She was shaken and terribly scared, claiming she could hear footsteps chasing her to her car before she got in and drove off. We wrote it off as a freak accident, as we were all asleep and sounded too bizarre to worry of anything. As she pulled into the subdivision, she called us once again to help her unload the car, and probably console given the bizarre experience. I opened the garage door and stood in the driveway with my wife waiting for her to pull in. She came racing into the driveway and jumped out of the car, and this is where I lost it. As she opened the car door, a finger fell out. She had not stopped and drove straight to us after she came across the dummy. The person who had placed the dummy had chased her back to her car, and as she slammed the door and sped off, the person had reached out, losing a finger in the slammed door. We immediately called the police in the area, where she said she stopped at. The cops did a survey of all the hospitals in the area for a man missing a finger, and they found an exact match of his description. He was still in the hospital as he was arrested, 
The police did not give any details into the man's past or who he was, just simply told us to not worry about him, as he'd been arrested. I'm sure it's an anticlimactic ending to a terrifying scenario, but I will never forget the feeling that came over me when the finger fell out of her car door. I always drive with a firearm in my vehicle now, any time I need to travel. While on a horse ride around the land of a friend's farm, we found what appeared to be the site of a death. The town we were just outside of had been the site of many a gold mine in the past. While out riding, we spotted a large hill and decided to appreciate the view from the top. Subsequently, we stumbled across an abandoned mine. The mine had various levels and pockets dotted around it, and we had fun exploring. This really is in the middle of nowhere, surrounded all around by natural bush and far from any thoroughfare. We wandered into an opening we were yet to explore and shortly came to the back of a shaft. To our left, a shaft opened and dropped well over 40 to 50 meters to the bottom of the mine. We could faintly make out the bottom in the low light. To our right was a small pit filled with stone fragments. Jumping into the pit, I was immediately struck by a strange feeling unlike anything I have yet to experience before or since. At this point, I should mention that the indigenous people of this area in Southern Africa believe in the power of witchcraft. I have seen firsthand how these beliefs can have dramatic effects on people. Some refuse modern medicine to the point of death, and others can become frozen with fear or convinced of death. Indeed, healthy people can die almost overnight, despite being in fine physical health. But back to the story. Hopping into this pit, I immediately felt uneasy. Looking about, I quickly spotted a human effigy made up of wound clear plastic on the floor. Attached to its waist was a scrap of blue material from a worker's overalls. I hesitated to touch it, as many African superstitions believe walking over or coming into contact with such props brings the curse into effect. I can't say why, but it definitely seemed to emanate a rather sinister feel to it. I quickly scrambled out of the pit and headed out to the sunshine leaving the pit behind. Shortly afterwards, we made our way to the base of the mine to further explore. We ended up at the bottom of the shaft we had seen from above and discovered a rather disturbing scene. Directly below the opening we had looked down from was a large dark brown stain, about five to six foot wide in radius. Shreds of blue overall material were there, and a large chunk of it was still intact, with a few various pieces of what seemed to be bone scattered around. We had very little light and were rather spooked by the scene, so we hightailed it out of there and never returned. I am confident this is the result of someone being killed and disposed of, or someone killing themselves due to the superstitious beliefs, like, I am cursed, therefore I will slash must die. Considering this area still had elephants roaming through occasionally, and the odd leopard sighting, you can see wildlife making a quick job clearing up the body after the deed. Make of it what you will. This all went down during the spring break of my junior year of high school. My school was in a pretty small Iowa town with a district spanning several smaller hamlets. During the summer of 2014, a few friends of mine put together a film club that would make short films and compete 
in national film festivals against other schools. We were a pretty small group and found it kind of difficult to get together for any actual filming until spring break of 2015, when we made plans for a little excursion. Four of us ended up going on the trip, myself and three members of the club, Jake, Bill and Kyle. We ended up choosing to go camping out at Mossy Glen Hollow, a supposedly haunted state park up in northeastern Iowa. Since the 1850s, there have been several murders and suicides out at Mossy Glen, including a few decapitations and a hired hitman in the 1930s. Being the edgy teens that we were, we jumped at the chance to go hiking and camping somewhere like that. It was within 15 minutes of a small town, so stocking up on food wouldn't be that big of an issue either. So, all lights green. We load up two of our sedans, programmed the GPS, and off we were for a spring break, camping in some haunted woods. After the first hour and a half on the road, a few red flags began to fly. After the last large town before getting way out in the boondocks, my phone's data signal cut out and the GPS randomly changed directions on us. Since none of us had any idea where the hell we were at or where Mossy Glen was supposed to be, we didn't have much choice but to blindly follow the new route. Here's a little something about Iowa land distribution, especially up north, because the hills can get so uneven at places, you end up with portions of land that are too steep or too rocky to farm, or small flat basins that are surrounded by steep slopes that it makes farming incredibly difficult. Over the course of several decades, you end up with farms buying a plot of farmland with patches of unworkable land stuck in between. Rather than buy this land and pay property tax on it for several centuries, as these farms stay in the family for generations, the land either remains unpurchased and public, repurchased by the state, or donated to the state or DNR. Many of these plots get designated as state parks or preserves surrounded by private property, such as. As soon as we found out Mossy Glen Hollow. This explains the private property signs we saw by the lake, which was land purchased right next to the unusable boulder covered creek. This is a bit important for the sake of the story. And now that you understand it, we will dive back in there. Once we're firmly in the middle of nowhere, our GPS took us off the paved highways and onto gravel roads. At this point, you typically would see the usual brown Iowa DNR signs, designating that you were near a state park, but there were none. There weren't even any tree clumps to indicate that you were near some sort of forest. Red flag number two. Another 10 minutes or so into the drive, and the gravel road soon turns into a dirt road, then a low maintenance road, then a class B minimum maintenance road, with Iowa's dedication to road preservation. This basically means that somebody probably came by and took a peek in the 90s, and promptly forgot about its existence. As we came around the last hilly bend that the GPS shows on our route, we see a farmhouse with a large machine shed with no lights or activity around either, and no cars in the driveway. A bit weirded out that a house would be right next to a state park, we slow down and keep rolling. To our dismay, however, the road dissolves into a mess of washed tractor tire gouges from last fall's harvest. We stop the cars as far down as we can pass without getting hung up on a frozen rut and unpack some of our equipment. The road gradually narrows, snakes down the middle of a field and turns down into the small but very thick clump of woods at the bottom of a wide ravine. We get out 
and hike down the gradually steepening slope and take in the scenery. At first, everything looks like a pretty damn cool set to film at. There are several lime outcrops hanging off the hillside, a footpath with some picturesque tree overhang, and even a few birds out that made an unseasonal return from wintering down south. We can all hear some water running, but can't identify a source from the trail. Looking off in any direction, all that we see was a seemingly endless sea of trees. At the bottom of the hill was a small pond, in the middle of a grassy clearing with a fence. As we approached the fence, we noticed a sign, private property, keep out. Bill checks his watch and realizes it's almost time for dinner. So we trek back to our vehicles and hook up the GPS. The nearest town over was a little place called Edgewood that had several diners and a gas station to load up on supplies for the week. We brought some canned food, but not much beyond that. As we got to town, we realized that Edgewood was a lot smaller than we had expected. Less than 900 people, it would turn out. Everyone knows everyone in these small towns, so we got several weird looks when four strangers rolled up with plates from the other side of the state. Kyle thought to ask the cashier and a few people at the gas station about Mossy Glen Hollow and why the only route in was through some dude's field on a busted out dirt road. To our surprise, nobody had even heard of a place called Mossy Glen, nor could they figure out why the hell four high schoolers suddenly rolled into town looking for the place. Red flag number three. We shrug it off as just a few crazy locals and take off back down the dirt trail. As we round the corner back near the farmhouse, we notice all the lights are off and nobody seems to be home. I suggest that we leave some sort of note on the house door, that we're going to be parking on the side of the road near their place, just to be safe. It's starting to get late in the day, and being this far out in the country, it wouldn't be unheard of to come face to face with a shotgun when the homeowner finds our cars, since the road is impassable from that point onwards. Parking there, wouldn't realistically block anyone off the road and would still technically be on public land. We hike back down the wooded trail and start scouting for a place to set up camp for the night, making sure to be on the public side of the fenced pond area. We discover that the sea of trees that we saw earlier was actually quite a bit thinner when seen from below. In fact, the dirt path led to a decently sized clearing with a creek and small waterfall cutting through the limestone deposits. None of us could believe that we had missed such a thing a few hours earlier. When Bill comes to a realization, he disappears around the corner, back into the trees and emerges at the top of the trail a few minutes later. Though we could plainly see him, the trees lined up just right so that he could not see anything beyond the rocks below the path ledge. Continuing further up the creek, we noticed that there are conveniently placed rocks about the perfect distance apart to step without disturbing the water or surrounding rocks. One could walk almost silently up and down the creek while the sound of the water masked the steps. Not thinking much of it, we take some pictures of the large moss covered boulders and get some pretty nice scenic shots. We find a place to make camp and everything is going great until we approach the waterfall. Just before the waterfall sat a clearing without any large boulders or rocks and an odd arrangement of logs. One sat horizontal supported at each end by two piles of rocks. In front sat a crude stone circle with a pile of burnt logs inside. A fire pit with a bench. Though a bit of a surprise at first, we shrug it off as some weekend project that the people up at the house put together. 
After all, with such a cool place just a short walk from home, why not? I have a similar fire pit set up at home, so I'm not totally concerned. Hey, what the hell is this? Kyle yells it from a boulder a few yards ahead. On it sat a blaze orange beanie, a single gardening glove, and an empty can of beer. Oh, and a stick of deodorant that had seen some serious wear. Looking closer at the beer can, we realized that it must have been opened fairly recently. Foam is still fresh in the bottom of the can, and it had a fumy smell. Bewildered by what the hell we just found, Jake starts looking around the other side of the boulders upstream of the items. Holy shit, there's a cave! He shouts back to us. Later, he told us the cave was large enough to comfortably fit a person inside, and that, more disturbingly, he saw some red fabric inside as well. Before he can get a good look around, Kyle calls the three of us back over with a sense of urgency. He speaks very quietly to us and indicates that we shouldn't shout back. Shampoo, he whispers, pointing urgently down at his feet. Sure enough, in the mud and leaves, there's a blue bottle of suave shampoo right next to the creek. At this point, we're all adequately freaked out and ready to call our little soiree quits. Bill remains pretty sure that this is just junk left behind by the people at the house after a weekend and a few too many bush lights. But things don't just add up to me. There's one detail that I've been leaving out at this point. The day before, this part of Iowa got some heavy rain, which contributed to the mud situation on the dirt road and on the trail. With the combination of wind and rain, the items on the rocks would have shown some signs of being wet, if not then displaced entirely. Also, the air was pretty cold, as it is every year around this time, not getting above the mid 40s for the whole week. Then everything starts to click for me. Whoever drank the beer and left the shampoo, hat, glove, deodorant, must have done this sometime this morning. The fire pit also had fresh char marks on the rocks, and the wood had not been wet for a while, meaning it must have been lit last night at the earliest. The small cave would have provided enough shelter from the rain to stay dry, without the freezing temperatures or through the day. Whoever was using shampoo out here must have had little other choice to do so. If it was the homeowners, they would have had to be seriously masochistic to bathe in the shallow, freezing, rocky creek rather than at home. If it wasn't, then we likely weren't alone right now. Whoever left these things out left in a hurry, and if they were here four hours ago, they would have been able to see us on the trail cliff long before we even knew they were down here. Remembering the arrangements of rocks on the stream, they could have even been leaving their camp just as we were coming down the dirt trail. As I processed this, I started to look around at my surroundings and realized that the small area was bordered by the thick trees on the trail side. Several sets of huge boulders on the pond side and limestone cliffs everywhere else. Due to the tree, rock and hill cover, you could light a fire in the pit at night, and no one around you would even know. The illusion of being able to see up the dirt trail from the camp, but not down, played in reverse from the cliffs. If you were wearing brown or green, you could easily see down from the rocks on top of the camp below, while blending in with the trees above. Coming to these realizations, I noticed something else, something more sinister. The birds and small animals that were previously heard are now quiet, aside from the soft babble of the creek. The entire place is completely silent. As I start to explain this to the rest of the group, I see the wheels turning in their heads as well. 
Jake starts to head back to the small cave, when a rustling up on the limestone ridge catches our attention. Something large was shifting around up there, something that apparently didn't want Jake to see what was in the cave. We all look up at whatever or whoever made the noise as it started shuffling down the ridge towards the makeshift camp. Because of the high cliff, the only way down to us would be going all the way back down to the pond and then double back up the stream. Realizing this and almost crapping ourselves at how open we were, we book it back down the stream up the dirt path across the field and back to our cars. On the drive back to Edgewood, we all try and process what the hell just happened. I take a look at a satellite map and the only really accessible way to the cliff where we heard the noise would be to walk up there from the pond. It was too craggy to approach from the adjacent field to the east. Whatever made that noise would have been large and a deer getting up there wouldn't necessarily be out of the question, but I doubt it. It would have had to have been some incredible timing to have started moving around just as Jake began looking at the cave and whatever red fabric was inside. Kyle found a report of an escaped convict from a local prison a few weeks ago and was convinced that it was his camp that we found, though we were all doubtful at best of this idea. To satisfy his concerns, we'd agreed to report the strange thing we found to the police anonymously, since we all really wanted to get home at this point. None of us followed up with them, and I doubt anything came of it. A small close knit town police department gets a report of strange sightings for some stranger the same day that four high schoolers roll up and park outside a farmer's house for a few hours and then book it out doesn't exactly spell high threat criminal activity to me. Still, things still just don't seem to add up. Whoever came running down that cliff, if indeed it was a who, wanted to keep whatever was inside that cave hidden, but not enough to actually fight four decently tall and able teenagers. We figured he just wanted to scare us off, since the noises seemed to stop once we reached the dirt path. I thought it odd that someone living out in the woods with something seemingly to hide would set up shop in a state park. That is until I checked my GPS again. That little reroute that it took us on was an old entrance to the park that had been cut off by the purchase of the lake area, sometime between the map records used for Google's navigation being updated and that day. The current entrance to the park is about two miles north of where the GPS sent us, thinking it was a faster route. The place we were at was still public land for sure, but not quite what we pictured. So dude in Mossy Glen Hollow, let's not meet again. We live in New Jersey, and if you're familiar with the magazine Weird and Jay, then you'll know all about Clinton Road. For those of you who don't, Clinton Road is a road in West Milford, New Jersey, that's 10 miles of pure dark and winding of road in the middle of the woods, with no street lights and no houses the entire way. It's considered the most haunted road in America and is a popular spot for teens and young adults to look for a scare. Popular urban legends of the area a ghost satanic rituals and KKK gatherings in the woods, hybrid animals, and a spot where mafia hitman Richard Iceman Kuklinski would dump his bodies. So my friend and I took a trip there one time, and he's driving down the road and he swears he saw a fat guy with his face covered in face paint or makeup in his underwear, walking on the side of the road. Another time he said he found a red phone booth just like the ones in Britain, if not an exact replica, with an ominous purple or dark blue light shining from it. When I was about 11 to 12 years old, 
a friend and I decided to cycle deep into the countryside to escape from the hectic city full of warmth, due to it being in the midst of August. After a number of stops here and there, we came upon an area of forestry and decided to wander around, see if we could find anything interesting. But all there was were bird eggs, shotgun shells, and ripped fabrics around the area. But after coming to the end of the forest, we found something we thought we'd never come across. In front of our eyes was an old derelict castle that looked like it was burnt down some time ago. Even though it had a sign that said, private property do not cross, being the adventurous and of course, rebellious children that we were, we walked in without hesitation. A large majority of the insides were overgrown, and the floors above had collapsed. Even though at least 85% of the castle had been destroyed, you could still make out which rooms were such, as the living rooms had the fireplace, and the kitchen, due to the floor tiles being unlike the rest of the castle, that consisted of wooden floors. Our adventure soon came to an end as we saw a car pulling into the driveway. So as fast as we could, we ran back and through the forest and back out to the country lanes. But our bikes were missing and were no longer where we had left them. And after 20 minutes of looking, we accepted that they were most likely stolen. My friend rang his mum and after an hour of giving directions, she finally arrived and we headed home. The first thing I searched when I arrived home were castles in that area and managed to find a whole article on the castle, but on a paranormal page. It turns out that it was burnt down in 1925 by the IRA and two children and the maid were burnt to a crisp. The parents of the children were away that night, but due to the family being broken apart, the mother ended her own life in the castle, followed by the father a few weeks after this. This wasn't the only tragedy that happened in the house, as an actress was ended in that house before the family moved in. And during the 1978 rebellion, an Irish man who butchered English soldiers stayed in the house for a number of years and used the basement as a murder cellar. During the 1960s, when the land was brought by a farmer, a local priest had to be called in to perform an exorcism. And as soon as he took out a cross, appeared the ghost of the butcher and disappeared in a puff of black smoke. I don't know if this is all true, but it was creepy knowing that we explored the place where all of this stuff took place. I was on a weekend getaway with my girlfriend. We rented a cabin on Airbnb. It was very secluded and charming, nestled at the top of a hill in the forest. We liked to cook together, so we brought a bunch of groceries that we picked up on our ride out to the woods. The grocery store had a section of loose candy sold by weight and we filled a few bags. One bag had caramels, another had chocolate covered cherries. The first night we made a big dinner, snacking on the caramels as we cooked. When it came time for dessert, we considered opening the bag of cherries, which was still twist tied and untouched. They looked pretty tessellated in neat rows there behind the crinkly plastic. But we felt lazy and kept with the caramels, eating a few and then climbing into bed with sticky teeth. The next morning, we woke up to find the bag of cherries standing on the counter, right where we'd left it, but completely empty. The little gold twist tie lay next to it, unfurled. 
Everything looked like it had been handled carefully, as the bag was free of wrinkles, and we couldn't find a single cherry anywhere. We spent the better part of the day convincing each other that neither of us was pranking the other, and that neither had eaten them all that night, but was too embarrassed to admit it. We still reminisce about this and trade theories. We don't think it was an animal, because even something as dexterous as a raccoon would have certainly left a cherry or two out of place. Our best guess still gives me chills. Maybe someone was living in the basement of this vacation home, listening to us the whole time. In the year 2000, when I was 10 years old, my parents sent me to a five day summer camp in Huntsville, Ontario. This camp was definitely a Bible camp and being raised without religion, I felt uncomfortable there, but I got along well with my peers. Me and seven other girls were staying in the room on the far right, and there were three other rooms on the main floor, and upstairs is where the camp counsellors bunked. The main floor had a very high ceiling, and near the top was a small square door which attached to where the camp counsellors were staying. I was staying along the right wall on the bottom bunk. On the third night, me and my bunk mate were having a blast, just talking and telling jokes. But our camp counsellor opened the little door at the top of the room and told us to be quiet. So we all went to bed. Out of nowhere, I hear Brianna yelling, Cat, wake up, wake up now. And being the light sleeper I was, I immediately woke up. I didn't know how long I had slept for. I then heard Angel say, Cat, look over to the bunk in front of you. I was facing the wall. So I turn around and I met with a black figure with long curly hair sitting on the ladder, leading up to the top bunk on the bed in front of mine. The moonlight illuminated the entire room and this figure was completely opaque shaking her long curly hair. I looked around the room and noticed all of the girls were all accounted for and definitely awake. I stared at this thing for what seemed like an eternity. Every one of the girls were in complete hysterics and crying, but I was dead silent. I couldn't make a peep. I was completely terrified to the point I couldn't blink or even move. I mean, what could I have done? This thing was sitting there right before my eyes. Then this figure stands up and jumps off the ladder and just stood at the edge of the bed for a moment. All of the girls scream, cat get out of there now. To which the figure moved around in an almost robotic way and started walking towards me. I finally then find the nerve to book it out of the bottom bunk and run to the other side of the room. I run up to Brianna and Angel's bunk and climb the ladder as quickly as I could. At this point, I started becoming hysterical and crying like the rest of them. The figure was still standing near my bed. Angel and I started hugging and I was too afraid to even open my eyes after what I'd seen. Angel decides to jump down off the bunk switch the light on. And just like that, the figure was gone. I guess we made a lot of noise and the camp counselor opened the little door and told us to keep it down. We told her what we'd seen and she came downstairs to investigate. She came into the room and told us, there's nothing here. Your mind was probably playing tricks on you. Now back to bed. All of the girls, including myself, were still pretty upset and scared, and just sat up in our bunks talking about what we'd seen. Five minutes after, we hear screaming coming from the room directly across the hall from us. We all started crying again, and the camp counsellors opened the little door and told us, see what you've started? You have everyone in the cabin scared. The camp counsellor went to investigate, and we turned on the lights in our room and opened the door. 
we hear one of the girls in the room across from us say while crying, Something lifted up, bunk. Please don't make us stay in there. It's going to kill us. To which the counsellor sternly responded with, That's impossible. Now quiet down and go to bed. This is the final time I'll say this. After 20 minutes of talking quietly, we all went to bed. Nothing else strange happened during the duration of the camp trip, and I had exchanged phone numbers with the girls. About a week after the camp trip had ended, I contacted both Angel and Brianna, and asked them if they remembered that night, and they both said they did, and they said they'd never forget it. This was the very first experience I had with the paranormal. After the Bible camp incident, I had no more paranormal events, until I was 14 that is. When these occurrences started, I would mostly just hear strange stuff, like someone scratching the walls outside my bedroom, screaming and growling and footsteps, and sometimes what sounded like footsteps with long toenails dragging along the floor. Very creepy laughs that sounded like it came from someone with an incredibly deep voice, and occasionally, something whispering my name into my ear. These noises used to be confined to outside my bedroom, but after a while, they'd always lead into my room. Very rarely would I ever see anything. It was mostly just audio. When I did see something, it was mainly a tall black hooded figure, either standing in my doorway or the foot of my bed. Sometimes I would feel something trying to grab my foot, or something running its fingers through my hair, which caused me to always keep the end of my blanket tucked under my feet for years. These occurrences would generally last all night until sunrise, but its peak hours were between 1 and 4 am. Sometimes things would occur even during the day. At age 14 one night, I was awoken by shuffling, a noise coming from my dresser area. I'm a light sleeper. Any noise will wake me. And when I looked at my dresser, I saw a very tall hooded man, pitch black, going through my panty drawer. Even though I was completely terrified, I got the nerve to sit up in bed. The figure then turned completely around and acknowledged me in the room, by staring at me for a few seconds before vanishing. For some reason I had no idea why, but I fell asleep after that with no problem at all. When I awoke in the morning, one of my pairs of bras were missing, as well as some of my underwear on the floor. Fast forward a few weeks, I was downstairs in the basement doing laundry, and saw something hanging from a rusty nail on a support beam. And sure enough, it had been the bra that was missing. My mum's best friend Denise was over a few days ago to go blueberry picking with my mother during the summer. Denise brought with her about 20 packages of cosmetic removal wipes, which we put on the top of the towel cupboard outside the bathroom door. My mum decided she'd go grocery shopping with my dad to get food for supper, which left Denise and I in the house alone. Knowing that Denise was also sensitive to the paranormal, I began telling her about what had been happening in the house, and what I had experienced. We decided to get up off the couch and walk towards my kitchen, and then we see our locked front door unlock itself, and open, without any force. Wide-eyed, we both look at each other. Did you see that? She said. I then walked to lock the front door. This incident got Denise pretty shaken up, and later on in the night I was lying in bed, and started to hear a crinkly sound. The crinkly noise continued for a few minutes, and it dawned on me that it was someone playing with the packages of makeup removal wipes on the top of the cupboard. All of a sudden, they all fall down onto the floor. My mum opens her bedroom door and goes to pick them up because she heard them fall too. It got eerily quiet for about 20 minutes, and then the crinkly sounds start again. All the wipes fell down, and not five seconds later, my bed was pushed into the wall really hard with me on it, 
causing me to scream bloody murder. My mother came running out of her room asking me what was wrong. I was crying and told her what happened and she told me it was nonsense. I got out of bed, turned on the light and pushed my bed away from the wall when I noticed the wall was indented on the right side where the impact hit. I never push my bed right up against the wall. I always have my bed at least an inch away from the wall because my power outlet is on the left side of my bed. I swear, these are all true. I was driving to visit my sister who lives in Missouri. It's late and I admit I was a bit tired but not bad enough where I should have pulled over to a hotel. I get to this stretch of road where it's just cornfield on either side of me. I have directions to drive straight and take the next left. I drive and drive and drive and drive. No lefts, but multiple rights. Now, every now and again, there might have been a left, but it's a small man-made road that wasn't big enough for my car. I start getting a bit confused on where I was supposed to turn because I'd been driving straight for 45 minutes with still no turn in sight. I pass a left that was big enough for my car, but was a dirt road. And I figure how that's probably it. I take the next right and end up driving around a cornfield paved road maze. I ended up lost for about two hours before I finally found this small dirt road. I drive up to it and find myself at a house. This was obviously not the right left. So I threw it in reverse and went to leave when I saw a light from my field of view. I look over and there's a large group of people, over 10, standing around a fire coming my way. It was 3 a.m. I was lost. I had been driving in a maze for two hours and I was tired and it was enough for one night. So I drove off. I got lost again and ended up driving about two hours in the wrong direction. Found a gas station, waited for morning, and rang my sister to help me find where the hell she lived. As you can tell, this was before cell phones and GPS became prevalent. About a year ago, I was out back with my family. It was around eight, and the sun was setting. We lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbor lived far away and something down the field kept catching my eye, but I ignored it at first. My sister saw it too and kept looking out towards the trees. She was getting freaked out about it. My mum said to go investigate. So me and my sister started to walk across the field towards the tree line big mistake. It's hard for me to describe. This was the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I didn't see it at first. And I didn't understand why my sister was so scared until we were about 100 yards away. When I saw this creature tall, probably eight to nine feet tall, white, humanoid with an elongated head and no face. It had long arms and peeked around the trees. We stopped in our tracks. We couldn't tell what it was. It took a few steps further out of the trees and swayed back and forth, looking at me like a praying mantis. Me and my sister ran screaming back to the house where my mum stood, jaw dropped. She'd seen it too. I had never been so scared in my life. We grabbed the binoculars and watched this terrifying creature peek in and out of the tree line, spying on us. My grandma thought we all had a wild imagination. The sun was almost gone now and it was getting really dark and the darker it got, the more it moved back and forth along the trees. It was terrifying. 
so we went in for the night and locked everything up tight. I couldn't sleep that night. I was hearing scratching on the roof, and at one point, a very loud bang, and various noises coming from the barn. I was very afraid that I would wake up to my animals missing. The next morning, my grandma asked if we had heard the loud bangs outside that night. She ended up taking my grandpa with her on her morning walk. I have no idea what it was, and it still haunts me to this day. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor, and I were playing hide and seek in the forest, and the only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes to make sure it wasn't in my head, and I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the best of me. My cousins and the neighbor's kid were too scared to go up, but I peeked inside the window and I saw a dim light inside through a window and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled the other kids to run back the way we came and took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what I'd seen because I didn't want to scare my cousin or worry my parents. To be frank, I'm not sure if what I saw was even there. Late that night, I woke up to the sound of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight, and I asked my mum who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults that stayed over after the party that was going on. They all had their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard through the kitchen window. She said they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying, and there was a manhunt going on. I remember being unable to sleep for the rest of the night and the glaring white lights that shined through the folds of the blinds from the helicopters above. I'm still not sure what that all was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin we saw and if it was one of the parents that called the police. I just remember that we were never allowed to go near the tree line again when we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now, and I've had many other experiences since then, but this is one that I actually forgot about and reminded myself of recently while reading up Willow Wisps. So I thought I'd share where it all began for me. My name is Dakota. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and I've lived here all my life. I lived in the city, but I love the outdoors. 
During the summer, I'm always out hiking with my friends or fishing and camping. It's the thing to do. One of my best friends is called George. He would always talk to me about his father's property out in Duchesne. They had a few acres with trailers and RVs scattered around this little sandy cliffside that they lived next to that would actually drop you down into the canyon if you were brave enough to trek. He always would tell me about the freedom they had out there. You could go shooting wherever you wanted, even stand outside your own home butt ass naked and no one would care because no one was around to see you. So George had invited me to go out to his father's property with him. And I was really excited to go since I'd never been out towards Duchesne. The drive there from Salt Lake City is about an hour and a half to two hours. So it's a decent drive. When we arrived, I was pleasantly surprised to see his property was exactly as he explained it to me. And I loved it and couldn't wait to get out and explore. I should remind you that his property was in the middle of nowhere, right off an old closed highway and up a hill seriously in complete dry barren wilderness. There's cougars, bears, coyotes, rattlesnakes, and plenty of other animals that wouldn't mind making you their lunch. But even so we carried protection in order to ensure that nothing would happen. And that's another thing I need you to remember. We were armed to the teeth. George had recently brought an 18 inch sawed off 12 gauge double barreled shotgun, as well as an AK 47. His dad also owned a plethora of other weapons, which included a 30.30.300 ultra mag, a gauge pump action, a 24 inch long double barrel, and plenty other handguns and revolvers. So there was no fear of anything happening on our trip. I think we were there for about three or four days, just having tons of fun, shooting and hunting rabbits and snakes. But the last night we were there, something really, and I mean really weird happened to us. And I still can't explain what it was. So that last night we were there, George, his father and I had been drinking and playing poker and just having a fun time when me and George decided to head up to a trailer where we could just hang out together and reminisce about the old days. We get to the trailer and mind you, he has his AK and I'm holding on to his sword off and George decides to call his girlfriend back in Salt Lake to see how she's doing. And I didn't think anything of it at all until for some reason while they were on the phone, they brought up the subject of a Wendigo. Us being out in the middle of nowhere and kind of getting creeped out, we told her to cut it out and quit trying to scare us because we had this dumb belief that if you even mentioned a Wendigo, you would just be stalked by it. Even though we knew that they were just myths. As George is speaking with his girlfriend on the phone, I'm laying on his sofa right next to an open window on the right side of the trailer. And I swear to God, I see what looked like a person in the distance in the shrubbery and small trees, walking back and forth, almost trying to conceal themselves, but not doing a very good job. At this point, I told George what I'm seeing, and he starts to worry his girlfriend because she's hearing us talk out loud about how we think we're being watched. George gets off the phone with his girlfriend and just now reminds me that the trailer we were in did not have a lock on it. We have to get out of there. As I'm saying this, I noticed that the figure had gotten closer to the trailer and I got a better look at who or what it was. One thing I saw that I literally have burnt into my brain was this thing's neck. It was too long to be a normal human. It stretched out and almost caused its head to bob around like a weight on top of a loose spring. Once I said this, he wasn't against leaving, but mentioned that we would have to go outside where this guy was if we wanted to get anywhere. So we made a very difficult choice. We only had a small electric lantern that would only illuminate about five or six feet in front of us. As we're standing back to back with our weapons in hand, literally ready to shoot anything that approaches us. 
We just stood back to back and circled around and around as we walked to the other trail that was about 50 yards away. And during that time, we were hysterical. We didn't hear any footsteps following us as we made our way to the other trailer. This is when things get a bit messed up. When we finally got to the other one, the trailer that had a lock on it, we tried to be as silent as we could. We didn't even want to risk looking out the windows or moving the curtains to give away where we were. About an hour passes, and at this point we think we're in the clear, and the next thing we know, we are looking at the shadow of this thing standing directly in front of the moonlight, in front of the curtained window, standing completely still. We are just about to defecate in our pants. Then as soon as it was there, it was gone. We didn't see it move, didn't hear it, just looked back and it had vanished. The oddest thing happened after this though. I started to hear a pig like it was in its pen waking up a storm. And I turned to George and asked him if he heard what I heard. And we just heard this weird disembodied voice come from outside the trailer. Oink. Not like a pig, but a person. This voice was sinister, like they wanted us to know that we were afraid. And it was said mockingly. I don't know if this was just some guy in a weird way, trying to get around terrorizing random people's property. I have no clue, but I didn't want to go back and find out. If anyone has any information or could help me figure out what was happening, I would very much appreciate it. Till then, I'm trying not to think about it. Back in primary school, third grade, we had this third grade camp on our school's rugby field on a Friday night. No tents though. We all slept in the clubhouse on the field. It was a lit night. We played games, hide and seek, sang songs, and teased the third grade couples. It was an amazing night. Till my group of friends and I went out to hide on the other side of the rugby field, with all the lights turned off. We had three flashlights, and being third graders, we were all already in this spooky, scary vibe. We were planning to go hide in the tree, where we spent our breaks during school, but quickly decided otherwise when we saw two men. Well, they may have been teenagers, but we were short, and it was quite dark. And ran back to our clubhouse, and told the three class teachers who were spending the night with us. All us children were called inside the clubhouse for safety and supervision. The male teacher that was with us took a flashlight and went to check if they really were the two guys there. And if they were, how? As they must have broken into school, because the only way to get to the field was through the school. We were supposed to close the blinds in order not to see. But I was too curious, so kept peeking under the blind closest to me. To this day, I remember the teacher walking 40 meters until he was behind a tree. From my angle, I could see him. He was just standing there for two minutes, then came back and told the other teachers he saw nothing, but that they should call the police just in case. He was too damn scared to check it out himself. Well, I feel you, bro. Anyway, later that night, two cops arrived, and a few minutes later, two more vans pulled up. We were sent home. Some of the parents weren't happy to come and fetch us at 10 p.m., and the children who didn't have lifts had to go sleep at the teachers' houses. We were never told what the cops found that night. So I did some digging, many years later, as I'm 16 now. The creepy thing was, the Monday that we went to school again, my group and I went to the tree where we saw two men. The tree had lots of cuts in it, clearly by some knife. There were also numbers written all over the tree. But the sight of a big body sized hole covered up with sand made my group and I decide not to sit there anymore. What I found out was that this mentally ill person was coerced to bury a body there 
that night. We were incredibly close to it when we were playing hide and seek, and I'm so glad we didn't venture any further, as our fates might have been the same as the poor soul who was being put in the ground of our school. About 15 years ago, my parents, my brother and I, were driving around the countryside looking for a way back to the highway, after going to see a house outside of the city. The vegetation is mostly tall grass and dead trees, and the dirt road isn't lit at all, which at night gives the surroundings a kind of eerie feeling. My dad's Nissan Primera it's making his way through the countless deserted crossroads, and we are lost as hell, because there was no GPS back then. As we are arriving at another crossroads, we see there's something in the middle of the road. It looks like a baby carriage. As we get closer, my father slows down on the side of the carriage, and my mother starts shouting. There in the middle of the road is a beat up baby carriage on its side, and we can hear a baby crying. My mum is going, my god the baby, get the baby! And as she goes to open her door, my dad punches in gear and does one of those movie moves where the car slides a bit and does a gravel kick. He basically wants to haul ass out of there. My mother is still crying and screaming, her door half open, and my brother and I look back just in time to see four guys jump out the tall grass on the side of the road, holding planks and baseball bats and other weapons. We eventually find our way to the highway, and stop at a gas station right at the entrance. My father tells the gas station attendant what we just saw, and the dude goes, Oh yeah, those guys. They're always doing that to steal cars and money. They basically put a baby doll in a carriage, and when you stop the car, they jump out the bushes and jack you for all you've got. We never went back to that region after that. Summer 1980 me and my family had a tradition of going down to our log cabin in the middle of the woods. We would make s'mores, tell jokes, and enjoy each other's company for about a week. This was the excuse to see the extended family, so that we didn't have to necessarily all see each other on the holidays when we were inevitably busy with other things and other family members. So it was generally agreed that the summer week was sacred amongst family. There's one family member in particular who was slightly estranged and had only started coming to these gatherings a few years prior. Most of our interactions with her were limited to these occasions. I am talking of my aunt Muriel. She had been a spinster her entire life, never married, and seemingly never had a love interest, according to my family. She was a miserable old cow, in the nicest possible way. She smoked like a chimney on fire, drank an awful lot, and was just generally a very miserable person. And that's me trying to tell you the best of her. So even though she's family, we tried our best to keep her at bay because the moment she started drinking, which she did a lot, her mood would go down, and she'd get angry very quickly. With that being said, as you can imagine, none of us were particularly looking forward to seeing her. This year, we were informed that she had come down a few days early to the cabin. It was swelteringly hot that year, and was apparently going to prepare the beds for everyone and stock the fridge. So when the day comes around, we start making our way. Remember that this is in the 80s, so there's no cell phones or anything of the like, and the fact that we hadn't heard from her in a while was not uncommon in the slightest. 
We are the first to get there. Me and my sister jump out the car as my parents immediately go to the trunk and start getting our things to unpack. I open the door and am met with a stench so foul, my nostrils nearly exploded. I wanted to vomit there and then. I had no idea what the smell could be, and only as I approached further into the cabin, despite my sister's protest, did I see the genesis of such. There was Auntie Muriel, on the floor, in a pool of blood, dead. She had clearly been there a few days. The smell was overwhelming. As I said before, it was very hot here during the summer, and it didn't take kind on her festering body, not to mention the fact that she was very overweight. In any case, we screamed, ran outside and got my parents, who after one sniff and hearing our explanation didn't even bother going in to check. They had to go out to town to find a phone, which was a near 40 minute drive, get in contact with the authorities and then come back. About three hours later, some of our other relatives have arrived, cousins, uncles and aunts. And finally, the cops arrive. They have about 20 of us just sitting outside the cabin. We look up in dismay as they do what they need to do. They tell us it's best that we go. Some of the adults stay behind and my uncle ferries us to his farmhouse not too far away. When we arrive, we're all just sitting there in silence, unsure as to what to do. It was a very dark night. We all end up crashing at my uncle's house over the next few days. The adults are arranging funeral care while also being in contact with the police to make sure that no foul play was involved before they can return the body. It was unpleasant to say the least. When all the information came back, it turns out she had died of natural causes. Apparently she had had a heart attack, slipped and fallen, broken a bone in her leg and her hip and bled out there and then. Pretty nasty way to go if you ask me. She had been there for approximately three days. So she died pretty much the day she arrived. That was disappointing, I thought. Even though I didn't like her all that much, no one deserves to go out like that. We never returned to that cabin. It was sold and I don't know what happened to it and our family reunions were now held elsewhere. But one lasting impression remains. Since that day, I have refused to go into a cabin, for the events that transpired then have scarred me for life. I was 13 and in a wilderness treatment program for behavioral stuff. The place was out in the mountains of southern Utah, by a place called Joe's Camp. Plenty of weird stuff happened out there, and I have a few stories, but this freaked me out the most, and the physical feeling I got, I can still conjure up today. One night we were sitting around the fire telling scary stories, and the topic of Wendigos came up. Some swore up and down that they were real, and one staff member said they were old tales of encounters in the area. We bantered about it for a few minutes, and then being the edgy teen I was, I blurted out something like, screw a Wendigo, I'll kill one with my bare hands if it shows itself. And later that night when I was asleep, I had this dream. I was basically watching this deer, in a clearing, and I had the worst feeling ever of doom. And then suddenly this deer is crushed, I mean obliterated, like I really can't describe it. It was kind of sucked up under a big rock, 
and its spinal cord flew out and impaled me. And I got the feeling when I was impaled. And it was the worst and weirdest pain I've ever had. The best way to describe it was like a dirty scraping feeling. I was then in the dream looking at my feet out at the end of my tarp tent. And I was ripped out the tent. I woke up suddenly and was sitting in my sleeping bag outside my tent making the strangest noise I've ever heard. It was like a wheezing screech, a primal death cry. I looked around, quickly crawled back to my tent and wrote it off as a bad dream and didn't really speak about it while I was there. I don't know how to plausibly explain it other than a weird dream and sleepwalking, but it definitely jarred me. And when I remember it, I can't help but feel incredibly uneasy. I work as a delivery driver. I was dropping a package off at the secluded home in the middle of the woods. It's a few hours away and about half an hour through windy roads in the forest. I call them ahead of time to let them know I'm nearly there. The customer's mum answers. She's very rude and yells at me over the phone stating, I will be waiting. We'll be waiting. I get it. Bye. Once I get there, I'm met by a tall man reeking of alcohol. I shake his hand. Now sometimes my hand gets sweaty for no reason, but my hands were very dry and normal. But once I shake his hands, he picks his hand up slowly above his head, staring at them like people do in the movies when they're screaming at God asking why. I then try to talk about the package. My job also includes setting up the device in the package. So I start asking him questions about the setup process. He cuts me off to tell me he's bad with technology. And if I say anything, he's going to get very angry at me. His voice is low and serious. So serious it doesn't seem real. He's slurring his words. He sounds like a movie villain and he's speaking so insanely slow too. After I get him to talk about the device, his mum pulls up. I ask her how she's doing and smile at her. She literally ignores me and looks at her son. He's giving her this creepy smile and puts up his left hand. He just moves his fingers up and down like he's waving, but only his fingers. She then sucks her and drives away. Now the guy has me move my car because he says a lot of accidents can happen where I parked. He says it multiple times. He has me move my car to a very specific spot. And at this point I'm scared but I'm just trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's just really weird. He then tries to get me to go into his house. He asks me multiple times if we can finish the setup inside. I don't say no, but I give him instructions on how to finish it by himself, implying I won't enter. I then tell him bye, shake his hand and leave. The incident really threw me off. Nothing in particular felt especially threatening but I felt 95% sure that those people had some weird stuff going on that I most certainly didn't want to know about. My family and I have been hunting the same property in East Texas for over 10 years, and we've had some really creepy encounters with one of the locals. The property we hunt on is timber company land it's way off the beaten path down some dirt roads. No power, no running water, no sewer. There are very few people that live in the area. Only a few scattered hunting camps and some locals. Our closest neighbors live in a trailer about a mile away who we've come to call the meth house. Now I'm not sure if there really is any meth going on there but it would be hard to believe there isn't. This place has always been odd. There is a trailer sitting in the middle of a pine clearing. The brush is fairly overgrown around the trailer, almost as if the property is abandoned. 
There have always been broken down cars and other junk strewn throughout the front. Cow skulls and hip bones are attached to a pine tree in front of the house, going up about 15 to 20 feet. It started out with maybe 10, and over the years has grown to about 20. For a long time, I thought that was the oddest thing about the place. 2017, things started to get weirder. The front yard collection began to grow. A rotted out taxidermy of a wild hog was added to the skull tree. A doll head was fixed with horns and some kind of gown and mounted on a stick by the side of the dirt road that we called the baby devil. Tripods standing about 12 feet high. Each were erected around the trailer made out of young pine tree trunks. One day we drove by and noticed that from these tripods hung the spinal column and rib cages of some animals. We originally thought that maybe they were using the tripods to hang and clean deer, but the same bones hung for over a year and someone would usually want to dispose of the leftover carcass because the smell can get overwhelmingly fierce very quickly. So we had no encounters with the residents and weren't even sure what they looked like. The place was creepy, but they kept to themselves until later in the season where we had two separate creepy encounters. The first happened to a good friend. He had made a quick day trip with his wife up to the property to fill feeders and ride four wheelers. To get to his spot, he had to go on the dirt road and drive right past the meth house. His spot is only a few hundred yards away from the house. While they were doing their thing, they began to hear some strange noises. As he listened closer, he could hear fast high pitched gibberish back and forth between two voices. He described it as a lot of yips, yars and yees, and the word Jesus mixed in. They decided to get on one of the four wheelers and investigate. They found two men squatted down, picture Gollum Lord of the Rings style, besides a large mud puddle in front of the house. They were splashing and bouncing around while furious and loudly speaking gibberish. Once they noticed the four wheelers, they in unison stopped talking and stared like an animal that has been spooked. My buddy took off on the four wheeler and didn't look back. The second semi encounter happened to me and my brother. We were up there alone for this weekend and were relaxing by the fire on a pitch black night after a long day's hunt. We began to hear something strange off in the distance. It was pipe organ music. There were missed notes and sporadic stops and starts. We laughed about how this seems like the setup in a horror movie and tried to ignore it. The music continued on and off for the next few hours. Then all of a sudden we hear crashing through the brush. This was very thick brush, about 10 feet high and 100 feet or so deep in between our camp and the direction of the house. This didn't sound like the usual spooked deer, armadillo rooting around or hogs coming down the trail. It was a crash made by something large and it was close. The rest of the night was quiet. No more organ music and no more noises in the woods. Likely just a local little old lady practicing her organ for Sunday service the next morning, drifting over for another property. Likely it was some animal that got spooked crashing through the brush, but we sure were freaked. We made a point to not be alone overnight ever again and kept a close eye on that house from now on. This was around the time I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there in previous trips, about a 250 mile trip just to get there by the way. 
we decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend, as this cabin was old. My parents decided to get work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo stuff in the rooms. So at the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to go to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, dad, me, and two brothers and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room and all that was between us and the living room was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if someone were to kick the door. As I was still waking up, I was in a foggy state, as most people are while waking up. I wasn't all there, and then I heard the voice of my sister saying, Do you hear that? So now I know this isn't a part of my dream, and that this is real. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed, and both my parents and sister are looking at the door and at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, Are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand, as my other brother starts waking up. The boot steps stop for a moment, then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means the sound came from the general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why someone got into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed, grabs the machete he placed under it, and heads towards the door, placing his ear on the door slowly, and tries to see if he can hear anything else. In one quick motion, he unlocks the door while yielding his weapon prepared for anybody. He walked out into the living room to check the other rooms and ensure that everything was clear, and it was. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked, and there was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing was tampered with. It was hard to get back to sleep that night, as I woke up that morning. There was no possible entry into that cabin, and nothing had been tampered with. As you can imagine, it was hard to get back to sleep that night. I woke up that morning, and I remembered what happened that previous night. Remembering those clear boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream, and that we could all experience the same thing. As there was no possible way a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my deal of paranormal experiences growing up, and me and my family have tried to debunk this, but cannot come up with a solid solution. If you have any reasonable explanation, please let me know. And just so you know, the boot steps definitely came from inside the house. A few years back, my older sister and I decided we wanted to go for a walk in a nearby park. It was early summer, and we had decided that we wanted to get healthy and eat better, which never happened by the way. So we decided that walking would be a good way to introduce any sort of exercise to our lives. A little background info on this park and the surrounding area. We lived in a town where almost everything was named after Native American slash First Nation tribes and names. Our local school district was a Native American name, our roads and our parks. This park in particular seemed to have many rumors that it was an old burial ground, but I thought that's nonsense and something that just dumb kids like to tell each other during sleepovers. The park is made up of cleared hills with a small paved path kind of meandering through it. If you follow the path all the way back, you have the option to stay on the pavement and return to the beginning, or to go off onto a separate unpaved path into a small forest. We 
have felt like we hadn't burnt enough calories yet, and decided to keep walking deeper in. After walking for about five minutes, we came to a small clearing that had six distinct paths branching off. The clearing had a sign claiming that all the paths loop back around and a few facts about the park. We decided to go through one and that we'd see how we felt once we returned to the clearing. When we had returned, we decided that we were probably sweaty enough and that we could go home to make lunch. We had gone back down the path where we were sure it led to the front of the park, all the while talking about silly stuff that the two of us had gotten up to in the past few days. After walking for a little bit, we joked that it always felt longer after you decided you wanted to walk home. And then, seemingly like magic, the path we went down had led us back to the clearing. We looked at each other, both saying it was weird, and then laughed it off as us not being the most trustworthy with directions. We decided to make sure this time that the path we went down was the same path the sign was facing, seeing as it greeted us when we first arrived at the clearing. I was sure we had done that the first time round, but wasn't 100% sure. However, when we did that, it had led us back around again to the same clearing. We decided to go down a different path, the only one directly to the right of the path we had taken before. Maybe we just didn't realize that the sign wasn't directly in front of the path. Still, we were led back to the clearing. We decided to make a system and to always go right of the path we had taken so that we didn't lose track. I remember us making jokes about how it would be the two of us to die in the woods that's only a mile away from home, or how the Blair Witch is probably mad at us, and that if we saw a pile of rocks, not to mess with them. We were very lighthearted throughout the entire thing. However, in the back of my mind, something wasn't right. The more and more we walked, the more I felt like something was watching us. I couldn't express it to my sister for fear of her making fun of me. Or worse, she's saying she felt the same way. And it wasn't the type of watching as though we were being hunted or stalked. It was like whatever was watching us was finding humor in us being lost. It wasn't outright threatening, but it gave a very uneasy feeling. When we had made it to the sixth and final path, we laughed at our luck, at it being the last path to choose. We talked about maybe going swimming later on. We were both now quite sweaty. However, when the path ended, it didn't take us back to the front of the path. It was the same exact clearing we had been stuck in for the past few hours. I didn't know what to think. Maybe our system was flawed and we had to think of a new way to make sure we weren't taking the same path over and over. As we both stood there in silence, partially from being dumbfounded and partially from being out of breath, I swore I heard something chuckle behind us in the trees. It could have been my imagination or it could have been an animal, but all I remember is saying, screw this and making a beeline into the woods. My sister began asking me what I was doing and following me. And I explained that if we just walked straight and didn't turn, we would make it out. She agreed and didn't seem to object to trampling through high grass, thorns and trees, which made me feel like she had felt strange about the situation too. When we finally saw a break in the trees, we sighed with relief. We walked right out of the woods into the backyard of someone's house in a nearby housing development, walked around the front and saw an older lady sitting on her front porch drinking lemonade. She asked us where we came from and we said we got lost in the woods and asked where we were. She didn't seem shocked in the slightest. Oh yeah, those woods will do that to you. She offered us some lemonade and a ride back to our car. We took the lemonade, but decided to go back to the car walking. We were a long way away, but we declined as it would be fine as long as we stuck to the roads. Anyway, no one believes me when I say how creeped out I was. I know that feeling disappeared as soon as we left the woods. 
All I know was whatever was in those woods wasn't happy that my sister and I were there. And I'm not going back to see what will happen again. I was leading a backpacking trip for a Girl Scout camp. There were two other adults, the counselor in the kids group, who were supposed to care for the kids as I taught wilderness skills. Our first day out, we arrived and chose where to camp. I told the kids and staff to set up their tents. I set mine up quickly and then told the other two adults that I was going off to poop. I walked a ways away from the kids, dug my hole and was doing my business when gunshots fired. I wasn't finished though, so although I knew the kids would be spooked, I trusted the counselors were doing their job and taking care of them. I finished, left no trace, and hiked back to the camp where the kids set up. I arrived about five minutes after the gunshots. There was pandemonium. The girls were panicking. One had apparently taken the lead and suggested that everyone change into camouflage colors. A few had changed, the others asked me what to do. What I couldn't understand was where the hell the other staff were. I calmed the kids, explained to them that there were often hunters in the area and that they weren't madmen out to get them. I told them that if they really wanted to change, bright clothing was actually best, but they were fine. I then asked where the other adults were. They just shrugged. I found the other two counselors in their tent, which they had pitched far from the kids. They were relaxing, reading magazines they'd apparently packed for entertainment and giving each other quizzes. I was frankly shocked and appalled. I lost my temper and yelled and asked them why they hadn't gone and checked on the kids when they heard gunshots. They shrugged. We assumed you were taking care of it. But I told you I was leaving to crap in the woods. You two were responsible for the kids when I was gone. We thought you'd come back. We're taking a break. So I dealt with the kids, counselors included. I met the hunters while refilling water and let them know to avoid hunting in the area where we're camping. When we got back to camp, my supervisor got a full report and those two staff members were never given a backpacking group again or placed together. The kids, luckily, had a good time on the rest of the trip. This story happened when I was working the 150 mile line between Nashville and Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was working a local job on that run called the Coan Pusher, with the mountain grade starting at Coan basically going all the way down to Chattanooga. It can be a very difficult stretch of railroad. I had the third shift on the cow and pusher. It was all I could hold even if I didn't enjoy working nights. We basically just sat in the shop and waited to be called to help tonnage trains get to Sherwood, Tennessee. Now, all I can say about Sherwood is picture the hills have eyes with banjos added in. On the night in question, it was around 11.50 p.m. when a heavy freight train stopped over at Sherwood and requested our help to get over the other side of the mountain. We climbed on the engines and got on our way. By the time we hit Coan, and started curving up the foot of the mountain, we had no visibility of anything that wasn't illuminated by the locomotive light. We had a 30 minute ride ahead of us, along with a two mile long dark tunnel in our path. As the clock struck midnight, we were now in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods filled with wolves, rattlesnakes, and a few mountain folk. Most of the mountain folk are nice, but don't let the sun set your ass in those woods. About 10 minutes later, the north portal of the tunnel was in sight. A bridge hung over the entrance, a branch line that was taken up 
long ago crossed it, going to another part of the mountains. The bridge is still accessible by ATV. As I looked up, I saw a campfire and people. They all looked to be dressed darkly, perhaps even in mask, and all I could see were their white faces. As we started under the bridge, we heard a thud over our heads on the locomotive roof. We proceeded through the dark tunnel and slowed just out of the south portal as the conductor looked out the back door with his flashlight. He saw nothing. So we shrugged our shoulders and proceeded on the last 10 minutes on our waiting train. It was 12.20 AM and we coupled on the rear of the train to push it from Sherwood as the engineer on the head end entered the south portal of the tunnel. He radioed back to me talking about figures standing over the tunnel entrance. However, no one was there as it came in my sight. As we exited the north portal, I looked to the best I could to see on my side of the tracks for whatever had hit our roof. I saw what looked like a black cloak fluttering in the wind as we passed, but couldn't really tell. As we entered Coan, we uncoupled on the fly and the train continued to Nashville. We cruised on into our parking track and tied our engines down. As we got off, we had the feeling of being watched, but thought nothing as we parked our asses in the office chairs. We had no more work for the rest of our shift. We just talked and napped on and off until 3 AM. We never did shake the feeling of being watched. So we stepped outside as I put a pinch of dip in my lip and my conductor lit a cigarette. As we both laughed with each other, we noticed movement in the brush across the tracks. Now I must remind you that both my conductor and myself a big country boys who don't scare easy. We went over to investigate. We found three hooded men in the bushes with a huge spot of my tobacco. I asked them, what are you doing here? You understand you're trespassing on railroad property, right? The lead guy then spoke up in a demonic gravelly tone. We just want what's ours. As he said this, he motioned to the top of the locomotive. We looked to see a young man on the roof at the air horn. The young man was in nothing, not even underwear. And as we all looked at him, he bolted from the roof, climbed off and ran down the tracks. As this happened, the figures turned to chase. The lead guy then turns his head back towards us with glowing eyes that we could now see. He hustled, stared at us, and gave chase with his friends. We called the cops, and after hours of investigation, they found the man's underwear with no traces of him or the cloaked individuals. We even took them up the mountains. Cops love free train rides. There was nothing. Now on occasion, we find dead animals by the shop door or locomotive, mutilated, I've even found one or two at my door at home. We still occasionally see that same fire on the bridge and get the feeling of being watched, but it's all gone by the time we return. I'm sure there's a cult somewhere on that mountain. A few years ago, I went to visit my grandparents. They live in the middle of nowhere surrounded by woods. Behind their house is a shack. And of course, behind the shack is nothing but woods. My grandparents told me they would see lights in the woods at midnight. At the moment, there was still daylight. And I walked into the woods to see if I can find something. I found 16 black candles. I started kicking them down and headed back to the house. I asked my grandma where I was going to sleep and she said I could sleep in the shack. I was actually excited. I went inside and there was a bed, TV, PS3 and a few games. 
I had my cell phone, but forgot my charger. And it didn't really matter, because my cell wouldn't get any signal there. Now the shack only had one door, which was facing my grandparents home. And it also had two windows on each side of the door. But one of the windows had the AC bolted to it. And the other window had small curtains covering it. I was playing some MW3. And it was getting dark. And my grandma called me for dinner. I finished eating. And my grandma told me to knock on her window if I needed to use the restroom. And to not forget to lock the shack door when I go to sleep. I was watching TV for a while, and eventually felt the keen sting of sleep. I remember getting up, locking the door, and when I went to bed, threw myself and just collapsed while leaving the TV switched on. I had a dream where some girl was knocking on the window, and she told me to open the door. I unlocked it, went back to lying on the bed. And that's when I woke up in a cold sweat. Despite the fact the AC was on. I checked the door and it was unlocked. I was a little freaked out, but I quickly locked it again. I looked out the window and all I could see with the lights from my grandparents back porch was nothing. I lay down in bed again with my arms wide open and one arm hanging off the bed. I fell into a deep sleep again. And while I was sleeping, I felt really tired. As if I had ran for miles non stop. Again, I reopened my eyes and saw nothing but darkness. The TV was off, I couldn't move my body. It was like I was paralyzed. My eyes started to adjust to the darkness. And I heard something to my left where my arm was hanging. That's where I felt it. Someone had a really tight grip on my forearm. Then they would release their grip and then grip me again really hard. I slowly turned to look at my arm. And there she was. The same girl who told me to open the door. She was on her knees and she had her lips on her wrists and seemed like she was sucking on my wrist. It seemed like she would suck every time she loosened her grip on my forearm. I felt so drowsy. Hey, what are you doing? I said. She looked up at me without a word. I also think she was barefoot. After that, I lost the little consciousness I had left. I remember my grandma opening the door and saying, Are you going to sleep all day? And why didn't you lock the door? I felt really tired. I even asked what time it was. And she said it was five in the afternoon. I left some chicken in the oven if you're hungry, she said, and then closed the door. I tried to get up, but felt a sharp pain down my entire arm. I looked at it on my wrist and there it was. What seemed to be a large mosquito bite was bright red. Then on my forearm with a giant bruise. That's when I remember the dream. I felt it like I was losing my mind. I touched the red spot. And my entire arm hurt all the way down to the back of my shoulder. Even though I barely got up and went inside to get my grandparents. I didn't know if I should tell my grandparents or not. I slowly got up and went inside my grandparents house. They were both in the small living room watching TV. I opted to tell them about the candles I knocked over. And my grandpa said black candles are bad. And that maybe some devil worshippers that lived across the stream in the back were doing bad things. We all went to check out the candles, but there was no trace. And I just wanted to leave. Maybe there were people doing bad things there. I told them if they could take me home, but they said it was so late, I'd have to wait until the next day, which meant one more night in the shack. That night I didn't sleep. Every time I doze off, I quickly woke up and looked around the shack. Once the sun came up, I fell asleep. 
I heard a knock on the door. I checked the window and it was my grandpa. I told him about the dream. I showed him the bruise and the red mark. And he said he thinks it was evil spirits. And that he's seen some strange things in the woods. He said that they had tried blessing the house, but nothing helps. He also said that the paranormal thing usually happens outdoors and never inside walls. A couple of days later, the red mark went away, but I had the bruise for about a week. Once in a while, I still dream about the girl. I just want to find out who she is, but she vanishes. I honestly don't know what she was or if she was even human. Perhaps it's best to never find out. I used to move around a lot when I was a kid. My dad was an engineer and he would get better job offers elsewhere. And there were also some drug circumstances involved that made us move when his employers found out. Anyway, one of the states I lived in for a few years was North Carolina. I forget the city, I could ask my mum, but regardless, I was about seven years old. I lived about a block away from a pretty sizable chunk of land that was heavily forested. My sister, brother and neighbour and me would all go there when we were hanging out and got bored with our trampoline. We used to go there to just suck on some honeysuckle bushes that were right at the edge of the woods, but sooner or later decided to go in. It was broad daylight when we went in, and after about an hour and a half of walking around aimlessly, we found this really old looking tree house. The house itself was just a cube of wood, although it was seriously tilted due to age. Off one of the branches was a swing that was just a rope and a piece of wood. Really uncomfortable if you aren't a kid. And even if you are a kid, you still get rashes in uncomfortable places from the rope. I had found it first, so I started to climb up the ladder slowly. I'd say it was only 13 to 15 feet off the ground. As I was doing that, my sister and neighbor went to the swing and my brother started looking around the treehouse. He found a bunch of unmarked bottles and broken glass. The wood ladder led to an opening and inside was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. Pictures what looked like hundreds and hundreds of pictures. They were all hung up by tacks in the wood. What was really weird was that it didn't seem to have any particular theme. I'll list a few things that stand out. There was one of a picture of a pole that looked like it was in a rundown basement of a house. The flash was turned on and everything else was dark. I don't know why this one stands out to me so much, but it does. There were a lot of pictures clustered together of different families who were in public places like zoos or museums, and they were never looking at the camera. I saw several pictures of neighborhoods surrounding the area and particular houses that were singled out where the cameraman went around the house taking pictures from every angle he could during daylight hours. I did see my neighborhood, but not my house, thankfully. There were tons of pictures of landscapes and landmarks. They just looked like your run of the mill photos, nothing out of the ordinary. So yeah, after looking around for a few minutes, my brother just came up and saw everything and freaked out. He made us all leave and told us to not talk about it. My sister told our mom about it a year later when we moved to Florida and she freaked out. Looking back, I think it was possible that it could have been a really weird artsy person, but it's so borderline creepy. I can't really imagine it being anything but a mentally unstable person. Perhaps that's my own interpretation though. About 20 years ago, a friend and I were hiking on the AT in Northern Georgia. We camped at a place called Indian Graveyard. There were no graves there, just the stumps of fallen trees that had died due to an infestation. But it looked like a graveyard. It was early spring, and the weather was kind of sketchy. That night, as we were going to sleep in the tents, the wind was blowing pretty hard. Suddenly it stopped, like a switch had been thrown. 
We sat up, concerned that something bad was about to happen weather-wise. As we sat there listening, we heard footsteps outside the tent. They moved slowly around the tent from the right, behind on the left, then stopped at the front. We were terrified. Without warning, my friend Donnie shouted at the top of his lungs, You better get the hell out of here. I have a gun, and I'll blow your damn head off. Well, he didn't have a gun, and he scared the crap out of me for screaming like that. He told me later he thought the footsteps might have been a drunk redneck messing with us, or someone trying to get up to no good. Right after he screamed, a huge round light flared on. It was about 10 feet off the ground, about 10 feet in diameter, a perfect circle of blinding light so bright we could see it through the orange tent material. Silently, it floated there without moving for what seemed like hours, and with no warning the light went out, and when it did, at the exact same time, the wind started blowing again. With only one flashlight, Donnie and I abandoned our camp and ran nearly a mile to where our car was parked. We got in and drove to Helen, a little mountain town about eight miles away. We parked in a parking lot and stayed in the car until morning. Right after sunrise, we went back to our camp. Nothing was missing, but we did find the ground disturbed around the tent by holes in the ground, about an inch in diameter each evenly spaced around the tent. Each hole was about six inches deep. We grabbed all of our stuff and went home. To this day, I haven't been back to Indian Graveyard and doubt I ever will. Back in 2001, I was 21 working in a hotel bar 10 miles from my home. This was on Christmas Eve. I had to work that night. The hotel was open and I was the new kid on the job, so I had to. I closed the bar at 2 a.m., went to change my clothes, and went to my motorcycle. It was really cold at the time, so sometimes I would take a very narrow country road that cutted my trip almost to half, which was only used by residents of a few houses. I used it as I could exit near the main road on the motorcycle. A car could not. It was me and my friend from work on the motorcycle, and after maybe a mile in said road, in the middle of nowhere, near one of the houses, I saw something when passing by the house gate. I then stopped maybe 60 to 80 feet from the house gate. We both looked back, and there it was, like straight out of a movie. The typical Hollywood alien. It looked 6.5 to 7 feet tall, with grey skin, the oval face, the dark eyes, the complete package. We stared at it for 10 seconds and it stared back at us. Then I proceeded to get the hell out of there. We both agreed to ourselves that it was just an idiot in a costume. For the next few years, I told this story to some close friends and family, just like I'm telling you now. We then went to separate jobs, but would occasionally see my friends, and we would always share a laugh about it. But we would always say, what the hell was a guy doing in an alien costume at 2am on Christmas in the middle of nowhere, in those pitch black woods? Now I'm 36 years old, and I'm a science kind of guy. I do believe that we are not alone, but I find it hard to believe 99% of the stuff we read. I would still like to think it was just an idiot in a costume, but I will forever think what the hell? This story takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Clermont County. I'm a female of 31 years. And this happened in 06. So at the time I was 17 turning 80. 
my boyfriend Michael, my friend Alyssa, and her boyfriend now husband Nick are the ones involved in this unexplained event. For some background, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods, and you can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and other random vehicles like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There isn't even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we would have been walking a mile one way to get there. So we're not sure how they even got there, or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I, with two other friends previous to our encounter, had gone there, and it was creepy, but not compared to what happened with Alyssa and Nick. So on our previous trips, we went with our friends, Tom and Janet. Tom and myself went upstairs and had a Ouija board. We just asked it stupid questions, and I remember it spelt out hooey. We said goodbye on the board, and were looking around the stairs, which was really just an attic, and we found a massive kid sock in the wall. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking. It wouldn't stop, so I shattered it to pieces and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were, and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was covered up, and then all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know it had broken, so it spooked us. We saw an outdoor cellar. We went in there, and there was a girl child's boot with a bone inside the shoe. And at that point, we decided to go. So my boyfriend and I were telling Alyssa and Nick about this cabin, and what happened when our other friends came with us. So we decided we were going to go check it out later. So the day this encounter happened, Michael, Nick and Alyssa and myself went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and crap, and probably spent five hours at the lake and just hung out. We left the lake, stopped at Alyssa and Nick's house, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car. And this is important for later in the story. After getting everything out the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house where we parked the car. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We have to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin as well. So we make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but whatever. Just like last time when we get inside, Alyssa and myself were going upstairs. I wanted to show her the sock in the wall, and I also wanted to check on the clock I broke last visit, where I'd heard something ticking outside previously. As we started going up the stairs, there was a big crash, like something had been thrown and knocked over. Alyssa gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside back down to the creek yelling at Michael and Nick and myself to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears having a full-blown panic attack, saying something. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally no one is around. There are only the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we think it's best to leave. As we are walking back the creek, heading back the same way we came, which is the only way there, Michael and Nick are kicking these huge rocks. We stop and realize they are huge rocks, I'd say boulders, standing straight up in a line the entire way down the creek bed. They weren't there 20 minutes ago. We would have noticed them. This really freaked us out. It wasn't normal, and is unnatural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul us out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights, and literally none of them would turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there, and now none of them 
will turn on. What is happening? 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house, where Nick and Alyssa's car is parked. Alyssa gets in the car because at this point, she's ready to go home and forget this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car and Alyssa suddenly gets out the car screaming, jumping up and down and flailing about. She is covered in ants. We are like, what the hell's going on? And we notice they're coming from the back seat of the trunk. Nick opens the trunk of his car and laying in the trunk is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier in the story? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long. There was nothing in the trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. And now there's a woolen sock covered in ants that's covered their car. This was too much for any of us to wrap our head around. Needless to say, we've never been back there and I personally will not return. So it turns out the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, but was often called Huey. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I even went, and he found these journals there. The man was allegedly a danger to children, if you know what I mean. His journals went into detail about his urges, etc. But again, this story is 100% true. And it was honestly the only time I've ever encountered anything like this. I will never return to that cabin. I can't explain what happened that day, and I have no idea what Alyssa saw that scared her so badly in the window. But I do know boulders do not stand straight up on their own in the line, and nobody could have done that fast. Nobody could have messed with our four flashlights, and nobody could have put that old, dirty, ant-infested wool sock in Alyssa and Nick's car trunk. If you ever are wandering through the woods, and come across a random cabin. Just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, who or what, who or what could still be there. I ultimately learned this a very unsettling way. This happened two days ago in Southwest Sweden. It was around 5 p.m. in the afternoon and I decided to meet up with one of my friends. We both have mopeds, scooters, and drove to the grocery store to get a snack for our small trip. After that, we headed towards a beautiful sheep pasture that I had been to once and wanted to visit again. It was maybe 15 minutes away from the center of our town. After a while, I came to a narrow road surrounded by a forest. Since it rarely drives any kind of vehicle out there, I started to drive on the middle of the road, and sometimes even the part of the road meant for the approaching cars. At one moment, I looked in my rearview mirror and saw my friend driving close to the edge of the road. At first, I thought she was trying to make a point that I should keep to my part of the road, but then she drove even closer to the edge and almost fell into a ditch. I stopped and waited until she caught up with me. We were both laughing and I asked her what happened. She said she was distracted by something weird on a tree besides the road and forgot to turn. We laughed and kept on going. Later on, we sat in the sheep pasture eating our snacks. We started talking about it again for some reason and I asked her what she saw and what she described was some kind of wood plank nailed to a tree and that it looked like a figure, a person with just holes as eyes. My reaction was, what the hell, that's disturbing. And she responded with, yeah, kind of creepy. We decided to try and locate it again on our way home. We stopped by the road and I turned off the engine. When I looked up, I spotted it right away and it gave me the creeps. It was hanging there in a tree looking all dead, and I decided to take a picture of it when we drove home. When I saw it, my thoughts went straight to cults and murderers that put up some kind of sign to show where they've been, or a hint that they're about to make a move. 
I don't think I'll go there again, and I'm not sure what it could be, but it just didn't feel right. A girlfriend and I took a two week road trip last year and backwards camped slash hiked the whole time. Insight, I am also a girl, two 20 something year olds out on the road. We got to one free campsite in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, and we were the only people there, which isn't unusual. So we just take the first spot and set up. As we make dinner, a couple pulls in, drives by and heads to the back of the campground. About 20 minutes later, they come back and flag me down. Have you guys been back there? No, it's a massacre back there. What do you mean? There's bones everywhere. Mind if we take the spot next to you? Not at all. Now we're happy to have neighbors. They stay maybe two minutes, look around and then get back in their car and leave. What was all that about? My friend asked. I explained to my friend what the girl said. And at that moment, we look down and see a huge femur bone under our feet, possibly a cow. Well, us being a little cryptic, we decide to go check out what they were talking about. We get about a hundred yards back through the windy camp, and there it is. Full blown animal carcasses everywhere. Some scattered, some still whole. One pile is what looks like fox fur, and another deer body still in a trash bag. Our theory is, that they dumped roadkill and scraped it off the highway there. But we didn't figure this out until a few days later. Nonetheless, if there's that many bodies here, from whatever cause, then other predatory animals know we're here too. And I don't want to be around where they come by for dinner. We decided to pack up and find a different camp. This was a few nights later. We drive around for about an hour or so, still in the middle of nowhere, and we haven't seen a single car the entire time. No houses, just old country roads and pastures. Mind you, the sun is starting to set. The road turns to dirt for a bit, and we cross a cattle guard and see the National Park sign. Sweet, it's a national park and it's free. It can't be too bad. My friend thinks it looks a little sketchy, but we're ready to relax and grab some grub. So I hit a left and start up the hill to the National Park. Looks like it's only about two miles from the map. And we start going up this road and get around a few curbs and the brush on the side starts getting thicker and thicker and the road begins getting rougher. Now to put this into perspective, we're in my fairly new Chevy Cruze manual transition that is less than a foot clearance from the ground, about a quarter mile in and we high center on a huge rock. Okay, as long as this doesn't get much worse, I think we can manage. There's no possible way to turn around or back out anyway. So we keep going. And of course, it gets worse. Every rock and trench, we hear the car scrape and stutter and stall. I grew up on a property that connected to a game preserve. So my brothers and I practically ran wild in them constantly. Over the years, there were many times I felt there was something bad in the woods. Not all the time, but more at night. And not even every night. We also had an outhouse. So I'd have to go out in them at night more than your average kid. Flash forward to being 14, 15 and deciding to go get some plants to make a terrarium. We walked back the public dirt lane not far from the house and still touching our property, a place I walked with the dogs all the time and went maybe 40 feet up the bank into our part of the woods. It's a gorgeous spring day. The sun is shining and everything is beautiful. And I realize I don't hear any birds, no squirrels, absolutely nothing. 
Then I hear a rhythmic tapping noise coming from further up in the woods. I figured it was a woodpecker, and I kept looking for plants, but it keeps making noise only when I walk and fall silent when I do. It keeps getting closer and starts walking to rustle leaves, waiting for this darn bird to appear. The noise finally gets close enough that I should see this devious woodpecker who doesn't sound entirely like a woodpecker anymore. There's nothing, yet it keeps coming closer and closer, making what now sounds like someone slapping their thighs in rhythm. Now it's gotten even closer, and I realize whatever it is has been messing with me the entire time to get closer. And I have that moment that makes my insides feel like they've been melted, and I'm about to crap myself. Because that is dread. Because there's something bad almost on me, and I flew through the woods and threw myself off the edge of the six foot bank straight out of the road. How I knew I'd be safe in the road, I don't know. I just felt like a boundary it wouldn't go on in my gut. It did follow me along the road for 20 feet into the woods till I came within line of sight of my house. I didn't tell anyone for years because I felt silly. And then one night I told my mum and little brother. He just looked at me and said, why do you think I stopped going back there? It followed me once from the other side of the road. And faster. That's when they all dispersed and flew toward. When I traveled to India about 20 years ago, I took the bus to travel from one city to another. It was a night bus, so most of the people around me were sleeping. It was dark, and the roads were surrounded by forests out in the middle of nowhere. The road was only illuminated by the headlights of the bus, and we were seemingly alone on the road. I was bored and passed the time by staring out the window. There I saw a creature on the side of the road hurrying into the dark woods. The moment lasted no more than a second or two, but I saw the creature clearly. It looked like something with a human body doing an inverted crab walk. It had the head of a Doberman dog or jackal and had a waddling gait, with each limb moving independently like an insect. Everyone around me was asleep, and I felt like I had gone insane. I kept telling myself, I must have caught a glimpse of something else and misinterpreted it in my mind. Because I caught a glimpse of it, and later years, I questioned whether I was dreaming it. I feel extremely certain of what I saw, but I'm probably wrong. There is probably a logical explanation to it. I'm a very rational person, and do not believe in supernatural things. But being in an Indian forest at night will make even the most sane person doubt their mind. Those forests are truly scary places. Dirt, but it was closer. Jack thought he saw something, so he took the flashlight. I, of course, was holding onto him so close, I could feel his heart thump through his ribs. He turned the light on, where we heard the noise, and it looked like around five piles of sand, like little mounds in a row. Then the noise stopped. We started to jump out the trailer, and we heard it again. Jack beamed the light and caught the flash of some reflective diamond-shaped eyes that quickly disappeared. Then those sandy dirt mounds began moving towards us at the same time, as if something small was pushing them from behind. Jack grabbed me. We jumped and run towards the RV doors, and I don't think either of us had ever run that fast before. He put the RV in drive and we sped off. We heard things hitting the back like rocks being thrown, but we didn't falter. We were constantly looking around, and I stayed right next to him. By the time we got to a small town, the RV was sputtering. Jack didn't understand why. It was in perfect shape before we left, so we pulled over to check the engine, and under a street light, he took a walk around and saw that the hot tailplate had been curled up, like folded up facing the back of the bumper. When he looked up, he saw all of the back window screens were shredded, and the rubber around the glass was hanging. 
He took some tools and some gloves and straightened the pipe and we drove a bit longer to our friend's house. We told our friend what happened, but he didn't believe us. The next day when we woke up, our friend came in asking what the hell we did to the RV. So when we looked at it, it looked like the glass was etched with scratches up where the screens were shredded. We had no explanation as to what could have cut glass like that. And there were dents on the top and the back. In one spot on the side, there was what looked like an impression of five fingers with nail holes at the end of them and a wide thumb. Needless to say, Jack had to pay our friend for the damage to the RV. And we took his new truck and drove the long way back home. And we never spoke about it to anyone again. He kept a few of those metallic shards. He said that when he held them, it felt soft. But when he accidentally dropped it, it turned sharp and hard again. He told me that he had to get rid of them. Because the more he handled them, the more he noticed his hands would start to blister. And he didn't want his kids to get a hold of it. I kick myself now. Because if I had known back then it was so significant, I would have asked him to let me keep them. Five years ago, it was daytime. And I was driving with my son in my small truck. We were following my ex in his car. And we ended up in that same spot. It didn't dawn on me that we were going that way. I started to hyperventilate and my son had to calm me down. You see, it was times like this that really made me hate the desert. I've spent the last 27 years in rural Colorado and have had one somewhat recent creepy experience that I can't explain. Three years ago, I was elk hunting with a couple of co workers in November. As we got up to our hunting area, several thousand feet in elevation higher than our hometown, we ran into the snow. Enough snow that we couldn't make it to where we had planned on setting up camp. We decided to make due and set up in a pull off at the mouth of a meadow that was about a 100 yards from some early 1900s herder cabins. We spent the night got up early and spent the following day trekking through the forest. The next night, we were all three awoken by a blood curdling tortured sound screaming from the direction of the cabins. It went on for a few minutes, then caught off abruptly with a bang and the sound of breaking glass. We opened our tent door and shined flashlights towards the cabin, but couldn't see anything. None of us were willing to go off into the forest at night. After several sleepless hours cuddling with my pistol and jumping at every little noise, the sun came up and we investigated. There were no tracks in the snow around the cabin, not even animal tracks. But the cabin closest to us had one of the windows broken out from the inside. All the broken glass was outside the cabin and on top of the snow. The only piece of furniture I could see inside it was a table that was on the side. The door was still securely boarded up. We spent the day picking up camp and moving to a new area. And after two more restless nights, I decided to call it and returned home empty handed. None of us have hunted in that area since. When I was around 12, I liked to take the dog out and go poking around the fells near my house, looking for fossils and generally roaming around the place feeling solitary. One day in a big pit of loose stone, I unearthed a bone as I was looking for interesting fossils. And then another and another. There was a complete and undisturbed sheep skeleton buried there under the rocks. Totally clean. No flesh or other organic matter left at all. Just the clean perfect bones laid out there hidden under half a foot of loose rocks. This all happened around the start 
of the first period of serious depression I got into. Things got very, very bad, and I became very isolated and withdrawn. I'd take the dog out across the furrows more often, and just walk around, getting a little relief and being totally alone. I revisited the place with the sheep skeleton many times, and started stacking rocks in a circle around it. I'd already gotten a bit of a wall going in a circle where I'd uncovered the bones, so I was just really building that up. It was kind of cathartic and cleansing to go out there and haul the biggest, heaviest rocks that I could find to build my little wall, my shrine to the forgotten sheep, fitting the raw rock together like the dry stone walls of old, picking out rocks just the right size and shape to slot into my circle. The circle was probably around eight feet across and a couple of feet high on the day that it really started to rain while I was working on it. I didn't much care. It was summer and not too cold and the dog didn't mind. But I think that I scared the crap out of two middle aged walkers who ran across me. They rounded a bend wearing their walking boots and rain gear to find a teenager in a t shirt, dirty jeans and ripped grubby trainers hauling a massive rock towards a circle full of bones in the pouring rain. I stood for a moment staring open mouthed at the male half of the couple. The three of us kind of stood there in place. Then they kind of shuffled around and turned back the way they came. And I resumed hauling my rocks around in the rain. A few years back, my girlfriend at the time and I were on a week long motorcycle trip during the summer hotel hopping. We stopped in a major ski resort town, which is a complete ghost town during its off season for one of our stays, because close by, there were multiple hiking attractions, one of them being a major ski resort itself. During the summer, you can ride the lift to the top of the mountain. And from there supposedly take a 20 minute hike that overlooks the entire valley. We never got there. We arrive at this practically abandoned looking ski lodge, maybe had six cars in the parking lot if that, and no one was there to greet us as we walked in. We kind of aimlessly walked around the lodge and finally hear someone talking outside the chairlift. I approached the guy and ask about this hike that was offered. He was a seemingly nice man, told us the directions once at the top to walk straight back where you get off at and there's a trail that bends to the left and follow it for 15 to 20 minutes. It's an easy walk and you see the whole valley at an overlook at the end. I gave him the $10 or whatever the cost was to ride the lift. And this is where it gets creepy. As we get to the top, the guy manning the console steps out and gives us a friendly wave, kind of a young hefty guy. He stops the lift and I immediately notice he must have had some severe social anxiety or was very intimidated by me. As I'm six foot two, 250 pound, tattooed and sleeveless wearing my leather riding vest. I'm used to people avoiding interactions with me. After stopping the chairlift, the guy turns back to me and just loses all color in his face like he's looking at the devil himself. He's so nervous he could hardly open the safety bar. So I pop it off and we hop off. I ask him about the trail and he manages to squeak out over there. He points directly in front of us and then he giggles. He giggled like a kid sneaking candy in the backseat of a car. As weird as it was, I took it as nervous laughter and out of curiosity for his instant change of personality. I drag my feet around the lift house and take in the view for a while trying to talk to this guy. I ask him a few questions just being friendly to show him that I mean him no harm. But he never bites for conversation and shoots back quick short answers. We go onto the trail, 
hike for almost an hour, never seeing anything but woods, and we never made it to the outlook. It came to a clearing in a field surrounded with more trees and no more trail. Total bad vibe. We almost jogged back the way we came. We came out of the woods, and the same guy from earlier acts completely shocked. We came back, almost like we weren't supposed to return. He asked us a bunch of questions about the trail, all while lightly giggling after each sentence. Then it seemed as if he was going to be in some sort of trouble, and hurried us into the chairlift back down the mountain. I'm an avid hiker. This trail only has one entrance and one exit, and we walked it from end to end. And Giggle Monster seemed surprised to hear we came back to a clearing like he's never known about it. The guys at the bottom of the mountain acted just as surprised. Maybe the body van was running late. I don't know. But that place had a wrong turn vibe all over it. About five years ago, me and a group of friends drunkenly decided to go camping. It was a decision made while being drunk, but when we sobered up next morning, we all thought it would be something really fun to do. We were on summer break, so we got together our gear and headed off in two different vehicles. Once we arrived to the state park. We all unloaded everything and started making our way through to try and find a decent clearing, not too far, so that we could drink our beers and carry on our little partying in peace. We walked for what felt like hours. I had to carry a whole load of cans in my backpack, and the further we got, the more complaining our group became, as we knew that it would take even longer to get more beers when we inevitably ran out. The guy who was leading us was called Chet, and as we kept going through, he insisted he knew the area, and that there was a fantastic clearing just a little further up. This phrase, "a little further up," I still have trouble listening to today, as it really gets on my nerves. For he didn't stop saying it, and after walking for literally three hours, did we all say we were turning back? However, fortunately for Chet, five minutes later, we found a small but decent clearing. Obviously, not the one that he told us about, but we settled there as we were tired, and started drinking. At some point during the drinking session, Chet went off to pee, and didn't come back for a while. We just assumed that his pee had turned to a poop. And waited up. About forty minutes had passed. It was taking obscenely long. How far did he go? We decided at this point it would be best if a few of us went out to look for him. Of course, there's no cell phone signal this far into the wilderness, and we left with flashlights and began to look around. It didn't take long for the people who left to come back. Saying that he wasn't within the immediate area, and we started to get worried. Some of us talked about calling the cops, but Chet was a responsible adult, and we thought that maybe he was just annoyed, trying to find the alternate campsite. Some of us convinced ourselves this was the case, but not me. I knew Chet quite well, and didn't think that he'd go along without us. He wasn't that buzzed yet. I was mentally debating with myself whether or not I should go get the cops, and decided that as it was quite late at night, and I wasn't sure if I could make my way back, that I'd wait for the morning and then see. Morning comes. Chet's tent remained unoccupied. At this point, we start getting very nervous. We shout, start calling out, and have no idea where he's at. I tell my friends that I'm going back to call the cops. I make the trek, running, panting, in record time for fear of my friend. When the cops get my message, they say that they'll look into it. To cut a long story short, we looked together, 
with the people sent and couldn't find him. It was a horrifying ordeal. This was a number of years ago and none of us know what happened to Chet. No body, no animals nearby that could have harmed him as far as we're aware anyway, and no sudden drops in the area. Me and my friends have gone back with the solemn purpose to see if we can find any traces of our friend, but he vanished off the face of the earth. Wherever you are, Chet, I hope you rest in peace. I used to run bread for a big bread company and started at 3 a.m. I had to drive to a few remote stores in little towns surrounding mine. I was about halfway through the 50 mile drive to the next town. It was dark and there were no houses around for a long way in any direction. I look on the side of the road ahead of me and see a backhoe which was odd in itself. Then I notice his bucket is super high. And as I'm getting closer, I realize he is gutting a cow that is hanging from the bucket. Now, I happen to have grown up around ranching, so I wasn't too freaked out. So for some reason, I decided to slow down and see if this guy needed help. I can't explain this decision. When I stop next to him, he just smiles and waves. So I do the same thing and ask, need a hand? He just cracks up laughing, hysterical knee slapping laughter. For some reason I start laughing too. And now we're two guys cracking up laughing, one covered in blood and the other with a truck full of bread. The reality of the situation makes its way into my sleep deprived brain and I hit the gas and get out of there. I thought about it and realized this guy drove a tractor into the middle of nowhere to kill someone else's cow he was probably poaching. And he was going to load the thing in the front bucket and drive that into his house at 3am. Who knows how far away he has to drive this thing. No idea what the hell was happening the whole time. And it's pretty creepy looking back. I'm originally from the Gulf Coast of Texas. And when I was a kid growing up there, it was very easy to go from the bustling bright lights of Houston to the dark deserted country road in only a few minutes. Not so much the case now, but ask anyone who's been far out in the country, away from any city or town, and they'll tell you that it gets dark out there. You can see the Milky Way in all its glory, but unless the moon is full and bright, you can't see your hands in front of your face. When driving, all you can see is the area illuminated by your headlights. Everything else is swallowed by the gloom. My father's family is scattered around the Gulf Coast, including cousins that lived far out in the middle of nowhere. One night, my parents, my brother and my eight year old self were returning from a visit from one of those cousins just a few days after Halloween of 1988. My brother and I were in the back seat quietly talking about a show that we'd watched once trick or treating had been over with. The show had talked about a shape shifting ghost that liked to take the form of oncoming headlights that never passed. And my brother and I were talking about how weird and creepy it would be to see something like that. Our dad then mentioned that he had seen those before and that in the back roads of Texas were a hotbed of paranormal activity. No sooner had the words left his mouth, a mile or so ahead of us, a pair of headlights appeared facing us. None of us thought anything of it other than to laugh at the coincidence. It was nothing unusual to encounter another car or two at all hours of the night in such areas. We kept driving down the road and with the four of us talking about various things until my brother noticed the headlights, 
which were still facing us, and had not gotten any closer. Cue the sudden, total silence inside our family car, as we all stared at the headlights. We kept going down this completely dark, otherwise empty road, and those lights stayed the same distance away from us, never getting any closer, and never changing directions. I don't know how long we stared at them, but eventually, my brother and I began to get a little freaked out, and we ducked down out of sight behind the front seats. Not too long after that, Dad turned off that road and floored it, and the rest of the drive home was made in total silence. I never saw anything like that again, even though we travelled up and down that road on many occasions after that. And a couple of years later, we ended up moving to Illinois to be closer to my mother's family. And while the back roads of Illinois can be creepy, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget seeing those headlights keeping pace with us, right after we discussed that very thing. A few years ago, my dad, my brother-in-law, my best friend and myself were tasked with refueling a group of eight that was hiking the John Muir Trail. For some reason, we were recommended a trail that would be a shortcut, and only six miles to the lake that would become our base camp. We later found out it was about 6,700 feet of elevation gain. The trail starts off on the eastern side of the Sierras, which is essentially the desert. So in order to beat the August heat, we started on the trail at 3 a.m. Our packs were all loaded, tipping the scales at over 50 pounds each, which was our gear, food, and weak supply of food for the eight we were refueling. The first couple of miles were made up of super sandy switchbacks. By the time the sun came up, we were all out of water, despite the fact that we had packed extra, because we knew there wasn't a source for the first few miles. As dehydration started to set in, we encountered a small section, maybe a hundred yards of trail, that was almost completely washed out. The main issue was that it was only about 12 inches wide of slippery granite, with a vertical wall on one side, and an easily 500 foot drop straight to the valley floor on the other. This was the first point on the hike where I feared for our lives, but we made it. Once we passed this point, we entered the tree line and found a creek for water. We kept moving up what seemed to be vertical trail for the next few hours, until we reached a meadow and another source of water. We came across a guy who told us he had just found a dead body, an apparent suicide in a tent just up the trail. Creeped out, we pumped our water filters as fast as we could, and continued up the trail. For the next few hours, we marched up switchbacks, until the point that I heard my dad, who had fallen a little behind, scream out for me. I dropped my pack, and sprinted on my noodle legs back down the trail where I found him. He was curled up in the fetal position in a puddle of his own vomit. He kept saying he wanted to take a quick nap, and I thought for sure I was going to watch him pass there. After regathering ourselves, and letting him rest for a bit, we started to move again. At this point, we were once again low on water, but the map indicated we were fairly close to a lake. I kid you not, when we finally got to the lake, it was completely dry. We continued on to our resting point, only to find that my brother-in-law, as he moved quicker while I stayed with my dad, was nearly incapacitated because he sprained his knee. We all slept like logs, and the next day my dad and I hiked the other group supplies the final leg of the trail to the rendezvous point, 
while the other two stayed back at base camp because of the knee sprain. On our way to the rendezvous point, we crossed paths with three guys who looked like they'd come straight out of the 70s. They informed us the trail we were coming up on is really only recommended for going out. The three of us then proceeded to strip down, frolic and sunbathe at base camp lake as we moved up the trail. After our whole crap storm of a backpacking trip, we get back to the trailhead where we find my dad's car won't start and won't take a jump from the car we had taken and ended up needing an alter data. The good news is that we were able to refuel the other group and we all survived. However, we collectively look back at this near death experience and words will never truly explain what happened. When I was 15, me and my friend were made homeless due to poor life choices. We didn't have a place to live. And he told me about a cabin that he and his family had gone to not too far from here that had recently gone out of business. It was lucky that one of us read the local paper. We tried our luck there. And after a day, finally made our way. It was a bit out of the way, a tad remote, but it was a decent location. And with a permanent domicile, or at least for a while, we could apply for jobs. We started applying. And one day my friend was going into town to drop off some resumes. And he never came back. A day passes, three days pass, five days a week pass. And he still never came back. I was starting to get very worried. So I opted to pay a trip to his parents house to see if they'd made up and he decided to live at home and just not tell me. They welcomed me with open arms into their house and asked me desperately to help me find my friend. I told them I had no idea where he went, but said that I would help and they seemed pleased with the answer. It wasn't until a few days later, roughly while 10 had passed, that he just shows up. I asked him where he's gone. And he told me that he was just standing here in the cabin listening to his iPod one minute and the next minute, the music starts distorting. And before he knows it, he's no longer in the cabin. He freaks out, runs around in the forest a bit, and finally relents to come back to the cabin. Only when he returns, a lot more time has passed than he expected. He thought he'd only been gone a few hours and was incredibly weirded out when he realized I was so nervous. We made our way back home shortly after and never returned to those cabins again, which I believe have now been knocked down. My sister is a very short and petite girl and her fiance a six foot guy who weighs more than 200 pounds, decided to do a little vacation type thing and rented a trailer out in the middle of nowhere. Sometime during their time there, this was around one or 2am, they got into a bad fight. And he stormed off to another part of the trailer. And my sister was left feeling frustrated. All of a sudden she felt eerily calm. And then she said, she got an image in her head of this clearing with rocks. And despite never having been there, she felt drawn to it and seemed to know how to get there. Like something wanted her to go there. So she put on her shoes and her fiance came out and asked her where she was going. She said she was going on a walk and then left. She told me she got about 50 yards from the trailer before she was hit with this extreme and heavy dread and fear and felt that if she went any further, she would die, but felt like she couldn't panic and run. So she tried her best to act calm and went back to the trailer, walked inside, closed and locked the door behind her. And before her fiance had a chance to ask what happened, they both heard something fast, 
way too fast and heavy, run from the forest and towards the trailer. It ran all around and over the trailer before they heard it come up the steps to the door and stop. Her fiance grabbed a knife and was going to confront whatever it was, but she begged him not to and told him there was nothing he could do to hurt it. So they didn't. She didn't get any sleep that night, and when daylight came, nothing was out there. The scariest thing she said was that they never heard it, whatever it was, leave. For starters, this is a story from my mother's side of the family from the early 1900s in rural Eastern Ukraine, told by my great-great-grandmother. When my great-great-grandmother was a teenager, she and some family friends went briefly traveling I can't remember the why, but that's not relevant to this story. They traveled by horse at the time, so it would take quite a while, obviously requiring camping throughout the whole ordeal. One night, the traveling company laid a camp in a steep near a forest and stationed their horses right by the campsite. It was quite deep into the night, and when my great-great-grandmother was awoken by the wind noises and the rambling of horses, which were clearly unnerved by something, as being a village girl, she knew she had to check it out. And as she got out of the tent and walked towards the horses, among the low, steep vegetation, she noticed a figure. It was smaller than her and was very hairy, with clear human traces. It was bipedal, kind of resembled an old man and had very long, hairy arms. The horses then calmed down and it walked away. Growing up and listening to Slavic folk tales, this didn't strike me as spooky, but more as magic and mysterious, in a culturally occult kind of way, if you get what I'm saying. My grandfather spent some time researching about it, as most people from this side of the family have always had a lot of interest in paranormal phenomena. Anyway, People said it was a leshi, a protective spirit of the woods, or perhaps a domolvoi, a protective spirit of the household. The latter doesn't seem convincing to me, as it was in the middle of nowhere. Basically, my guess is that it was a polvik. Now, in Slavic mythology, these are field spirits that appear as deformed dwarfs with different color eyes and grass instead of hair. Any European folklore always has very particular vibes to me. It was mysterious yet blissful. How do you see these beings? Like literal nature creations, ancient humanoids, fey energy spirits? Very strange. This is a story I heard from my dad on three separate occasions. He is a hardened Navy SEAL, has done it all, traveled the world, and is generally someone who is known not to be messed with. He has always been very strict, but also never lies. Which is why on the few times he told me this story, it creeped me out a lot more. He isn't one to believe in the paranormal. But this, I think, is his exception to the rule, as he swears up and down it's true. Anyway, a number of years ago, at least 40, when he was in his early teens, his grandparents had a big forest behind their house, many acres, and he would sometimes pitch a tent for fun and spend a night in the forest and come back in the morning for breakfast. And one of these nights, he made his way out, put up his tent, and tried relaxing, listening to the sound of nature. He fell asleep very quickly, but woke up in the dead of night. There was some strange rustling going on outside the tent. He, as you can expect, being the hard nut kid he was, 
assumed it was an animal or a person, most likely a family member, and without trepidation, unzipped and came out. That's when he was confronted with a creature the likes of which he'd never seen. It was like a dog, but fully bipedal, standing there. It wasn't even staring at him. It was at least 50 feet away, staring up at the pale moonlight. It had strong facial features, exaggeratedly strong muscles, and looked like it could tear apart a car. He stood there in stunned silence. The creature, as he thought, completely unaware of him. My father thought it would be unwise to make his presence known, and as quietly as he could, began backing away into the tent. He sat down in the tent, stared at the creature still, while trying to do it up again. That's when the creature turned and cocked its head straight towards my dad. They locked eyes for a second, and not a moment passed, the creature bolted away. It ran at a speed the likes of which my father did not expect. He even stood up to see where it went, but it was gone. Safe to say my father just ran straight home, and he didn't go camping again for many, many years until we were small children. I think he needed about a 20 year break before he felt confident again that whatever it was that he saw that night wouldn't come looking for him once more. I've had a few experiences. The first was driving to my friend's ranch for a New Year's Eve party. This was down in Eagles Pass, near the Texas-Mexico border. It was pouring rain and I was creeping down a back road with my high beams on. Something jumped in front of my truck, stopped for a second, and then darted back into the woods. It was about three feet tall, white, and briefly stood on two legs. I'm pretty sure Gollum lives in South Texas, and it freaked me the hell out. The second, an abandoned and torn up tent in the outback of Australia. On our road trip up the west coast, we took a little detour inland near Carnarvon to see the red sands and such. We went down a dirt road with nothing for miles, and we found a tent. We hesitantly approached it and saw that it had been torn open on the side. There was a filthy pillow and some scattered clothes inside but it was still firmly stalked down. It looked like it had been there a while. The final one was back in Texas, out near Enchanted Rock, walking around the woods with some friends when they stumbled into a pit full of rattlesnakes. I don't know if you've ever seen a snake den, but they tend to ball up into a horrifying Lovecraftian nightmare. I live in Pennsylvania, and have heard and found so many scary and creepy stories in this state. I'm not originally from here, and it also creeped me out to learn that Dave Politis said the entire state of Pennsylvania is a cluster. I live in the woods. There are a lot of beautiful woods here in Pennsylvania, and the seasons are so nice especially the beautiful fall colors. Like I said, I do live in the woods, and some creepy things happen here. I live on a very high cliff, and below are huge boulders, small caves, a creek, and miles of woods. It's beautiful and peaceful, yet sometimes creepy. I have a motion sensor light on the side near the cliff, and in the evening while doing the dishes or cooking, that light goes on and off an unusual amount of times. I always look out the window, but can never see what's setting it off. Of course it could be bats the majority of the time. However, I have a German Shepherd, 
and at least a few times a month. She needs to go out to do her business, or she may hear something that she needs to investigate. Like most GSDs, she is very protective and guards very well. Sometimes I'll open the door, and she will look out. Then her hairs will stand up along her haunches and spine, and she will back up and refuse to go outside. This is really creepy, especially if it's one of those evenings when that motion sensor light comes on a high number of times. This dog is very brave and extremely protective. She has never acted afraid of any person or animal. She has one focus: to kill what comes in her yard or near her family. So when she does this thing, I tell you it scares me, and I certainly don't want to know what is scaring her. If anyone's dogs do this, I'd love to know. I've never had a dog do this before. Could it just be a smell? She's been sprayed by skunks, and isn't afraid of smells as far as I'm aware. I'd appreciate anyone's input. This story takes place at the rather infamous Myrtle's Plantation. We arrived at the plantation around 2 p.m. And we were given a complimentary tour of the grounds. I got vibes all over the place. It was pretty insane already because I get vibes, but rarely do. It was pretty insane already because I rarely get vibes that strong. We were then shown the place that we would be staying the night, and were let in and essentially set free. I did my evaluation on the room. And then afterwards, noticed something. Near the back door of the room, I got insane vibes, like stronger than the rest of the grounds. I knew something had happened there, and I knew I had to find out. By this point, it was about 5 p.m., and understandably, we were pretty hungry. We left the plantation to go into town and grab some food. We got back around 6:30. And started to walk over to our cabin when a friendly woman we had seen earlier came over, knowing we were paranormal enthusiasts, and asked if we wanted to see her room, which was in the actual plantation, as we were staying in a slave cabin. We said, "Of course," and she brought us up to her room. We looked around, and it was pretty regular as far as vibes go, but when I entered the bathroom. I felt the most oppressive and awful atmosphere. It was creepy and terrible, and I hated it, and instantly wanted to leave. I didn't necessarily think something had happened there, but I knew that something inhabited that bathroom, and I knew it wasn't something kind. We didn't stay in that place for long, but it was cool to look at. We left after ten to twenty minutes of looking around. We went back to our cabin and got settled in for the night. Lots of vibes there, and my sister and I, who was somewhat younger at the time, slept in the same bed because we were scared. She and I stayed up pretty late playing a game called Farkle. It's pretty fun and a good time killer. And as soon as midnight rolled around, we thought it would be best to put the game away and try and get some sleep. But as soon as we had put the game away, and the noise of the game and our voices were gone, I noticed another noise. The rocking chair on the front porch of the cabin was methodically rocking back and forth, and the rocking I heard was hard enough that I was certain there wasn't any wind responsible for it. I got a little bit freaked out, but decided I wasn't going to mention it to my younger sister. As it would probably just trouble her, so she and I laid down to sleep. She fell to sleep quite quickly, but I was having issues falling asleep. With all the thoughts and worries running through my head, 
but all those seemed rather irrelevant as I heard footsteps on the stones outside our cabin. Now mind you, our cabin was fenced in, and so it couldn't be entered by anyone who didn't have the key. But regardless, I heard the footsteps, and they continued as I heard light slaps of feet in the wooden porch, along with a groan of the weight, and they continued on forwards, and the noise continued right on through the door, as I heard the figure pass right by my bed, but saw nothing, and then continue out to the back door. I also smelled some rosy scent, which seems to accompany spirits relatively often for some reason. I really had a hard time falling asleep after that. This event must have occurred at 1am, and I didn't fall back into the land of slumber until at least 330 when I awoke again, we went into the main house for breakfast, and we heard stories from the other campers about their experiences, which were equally terrifying, including people who felt a presence sit down on their bed in the middle of the night, and a person coming out of a cabin to tell people to be quiet, but the cabin itself was void of noise or people. We ate and shared our stories, returned to our cabin, and sat there for a while playing games on our tablet and just relaxing, as it was a nice cabin despite it being haunted. Then, I can't remember why, but my sister and my mum got into an argument. The argument obviously didn't sit well with whatever spirit occupied the cabin, because their argument was cut short by the faucet in the bathroom turning on full force and then back off again. The three of us freaked out pretty bad, and cleared out the cabin in no less than 30 seconds. And that was how it ended. And I'm never going to forget how scary it was to be awake by myself in the cabin in the middle of nowhere, to suddenly realise that I'm not alone. A few years ago, I wanted to take my girlfriend out on a camping trip, to get at one with nature. Two days in, and we were having a great time. We did some exploring, found a really pretty waterfall that we thought we could have been the first to see in ages, and generally spent our time relaxing and reading, which is what we both enjoyed doing. However, part of the reason I decided to camp in this specific place was because I wanted somewhere isolating. I wanted it to be just the two of us. In the middle of the night, I awoke. I heard a weird sound, like a knock on a tree. I twist around and my girlfriend is lightly snoring in her sleeping bag. I rub my eyes and listen. There's a tapping. It's carrying on. And then, a sound. It took me a while to identify it, but it was definitely scratching on the tent. Very light that very distinctive sound, as it goes from top to bottom. I want to call out, but I'm petrified. Someone is outside, and then I hear a whisper. Hello, dearie. It was Brickworthy. I unzip myself after about a minute, didn't hear a noise, and slowly peek my head out seeing if anything is visible. It's a full moon, and it's quite bright. I look around the clearing, and there's no one. The thing is, I didn't hear a sound. Unless whoever said that floated away, I have no idea how they left the area without making a single sound. I was visiting family in the US when I was a kid. We were on a three hour drive in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. I had to take a leak really bad, and my dad eventually pulls the car over so that I could go in the woods. This was about at 11 o'clock in the morning. I went far off to the road into the woods because I didn't want anyone to see me. I wound up being completely out of sight of my family and the road itself. I started urinating next to this large rock 
and notice up ahead that there were these three figures digging around in the dirt. At first, I was like, damn, these people will see me. So I continued to finish without urinating. And as I kept my eye on them, I noticed that they definitely weren't human. They seemed to be in suits. However, they also looked naked. You could see they had genitals swinging between their legs. At this point, I ran and quietly slipped away from the rock and back to the road in my family's car. A few years later, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries, and there was an episode that had the classic grey type alien, and it looked exactly like the thing that I saw in the woods. I grew up on a property that connected to a game preserve. So my brothers and I practically ran wild in them constantly. Over the years, there were many times I felt there was something bad in the woods. Not all the time, but more at night. And not even every night. We also had an outhouse. So I'd have to go out in them at night more than your average kid. Flash forward to being 14, 15, and deciding to go get some plants to make a terrarium. We walked back the public dirt lane not far from the house and still touching our property, a place I walked with the dogs all the time and went maybe 40 feet up the bank into our part of the woods. It's a gorgeous spring day. The sun is shining and everything is beautiful. And I realize I don't hear any birds, no squirrels, absolutely nothing. Then I hear a rhythmic tapping noise coming from further up in the woods. I figured it was a woodpecker and I kept looking for plants, but it keeps making noise only when I walk and fall silent when I do. It keeps getting closer and starts walking to rustle leaves, waiting for this darn bird to appear. The noise finally gets close enough that I should see this devious woodpecker who doesn't sound entirely like a woodpecker anymore. There's nothing. Yet it keeps coming closer and closer, making what now sounds like someone slapping their thighs in rhythm. Now it's gotten even closer. And I realize whatever it is has been messing with me the entire time to get closer. And I have that moment that makes my insides feel like they've been melted. And I'm about to crap myself. Because that is dread. Because there's something bad almost on me. And I flew through the woods and threw myself off the edge of the six foot bank straight out of the road. How I knew I'd be safe in the road, I don't know. I just felt like a boundary it wouldn't go on in my gut. It did follow me along the road for 20 feet into the woods till I came within line of sight of my house. I didn't tell anyone for years because I felt silly. And then one night I told my mum and little brother. He just looked at me and said, why do you think I stopped going back there? It followed me once from the other side of the road. When I traveled to India about 20 years ago, I took the bus to travel from one city to another. It was a night bus, so most of the people around me were sleeping. It was dark, and the roads were surrounded by forest out in the middle of nowhere. The road was only illuminated by the headlights of the bus, and we were seemingly alone on the road. I was bored, and passed the time by staring out the window. There I saw a creature on the side of the road, hurrying into the dark woods. The moment lasted no more than a second or two, but I saw the creature clearly. It looked like something with a human body doing an inverted crab walk. It had the head of a Doberman dog or jackal and had a waddling gait with each limb moving independently like an insect. Everyone around me was asleep and I felt like I had gone insane. I kept telling myself I must have caught a glimpse of something else and misinterpreted it in my mind because I caught a glimpse of it and later years I questioned whether I was dreaming it. I feel extremely certain of what I saw, but I'm probably wrong. There is probably a logical explanation to it. 
I'm a very rational person and do not believe in supernatural things. But being in an Indian forest at night will make even the most sane person doubt their mind. Those forests are truly scary places. <laughs>